Okay, good morning. I'm uh, Commissioner Ed Rothstein. I'm wishing everyone has had a very Merry Christmas for those that have um, celebrated and are preparing for a healthy and happy new year. Looking forward to 2022 being better and more prosperous in 2021 as we all work together. Um, called this uh, session a little short notice. I appreciate the, um, the opportunity to gather with uh, our experts and our team here in Carroll County. But before we get into that information uh, discussion, let us as always rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, for uh, those that are watching uh, or going to follow um, this meeting, we have uh, the CEO of our Carroll County Hospital, Gary Hoover, the head of our uh, health department, Sue Doyle and Rob Black, her deputy. Uh, we have Mike Robinson, the head of our uh, fire and EMS, along with Sheriff DeWeese, um, our sheriff in Carroll County. And on the dais, as you see, we have uh, my colleagues, Commissioner Boucher, Frazier, and Weaver, and Commissioner Wance is virtual at this time. The intent of this, and of, you know, and I'm gonna kick this off, was to provide information for me and my colleagues and the community to then have the conversation on what steps need to be made if they need to be made in moving forward uh, with, the, with the challenges that have been continuing to rise. Uh, the catalyst has been conversations that I've been having with uh, you know, my colleagues and those that are gonna be talking in just a couple minutes, um, specifically, is, well, especially with our hospital uh, situation. And having uh, met with the state health department and health officials uh, the other day, uh, the prudent measure was to have this uh, meeting this morning. So I appreciate the uh, short notice and our staff uh, spin and especially uh, Chris, really appreciate the work that you're doing in getting this all together for us. And with that said, unless there's opening comments. Oh, well, I just have to say I'm glad we're having this. Um, the way that the um, virus is spreading and so forth and everything's going on around us. I think we, it's good to have this conversation, have all, get all the information out front. So if what and if we're gonna do, we have all the information here because the more information you have, the better decisions you can make. So it's good to have everybody here discussing this. And I appreciate everyone that's here virtual and the people that came here in person. Uh, I do appreciate all that because it's, uh, it's just gonna make for a better meeting, better understanding of the situation. Okay. I agree. I think as we're moving into this, we need to get updated information on, uh, almost daily now. Things are changing fast, yeah. so we need to look at the I'm look at the agreement with my colleagues, and particularly we see President Ralston calling this meeting today because I think it reinforces the public. So thank you very much. Okay, Commissioner Wentz, you have. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the more information we have, the better we can be moving forward and uh, appreciate everybody taking the time out of uh, their busy schedules this week to uh, to be here. Thanks. Okay, and as uh, yes. Commissioner Wentz reminds me, along with many others, uh, the value that we have in everything we do is the transparency in the discussions and decisions that we make here in Carroll County uh, and for the county and for our community. So this is just another step in doing that. Um, we do welcome uh, public comment. Uh, we have folks in the room along with uh, possibly folks online and we'll find out about that. In addition, the last thing I'll say is we did receive, uh, we being, I know my colleagues and I received a handful of emails um, that were uh, some more colorful than others uh, on different discussion points dealing with uh, the situation and we'll leave it at that and they may be highlighted during some of the conversations that we have um, but what I'd like to do um, 
is turn this over. Can I, can I say something yeah. about the emails first? Sure. It's just, I just want to say, I do appreciate all the emails. I read all of them. I do. And the reason I read them is because there might be something in an email that I haven't thought of or considered before. So I do appreciate getting all the emails. It's another way that we can gather all the information that we, that we can before making a decision. So I do appreciate them. The tones in some of them I don't appreciate, but that's the way it is. I understand that. But I, I do keep sending emails. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, the public comment right now is scheduled for the end of our conversation. Um, however, let's see where this goes. And we may end up having public comments in the middle or after a couple of uh, uh, discussions that we have that are provided from uh, the hospital and the health department. And we'll, we'll go from there. So um, Mr. Hoover, our CEO uh, of Carroll County Hospital, LifeBridge, why don't you uh, get us started? Uh, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for the invitation again. Hopefully you can hear me as as well as uh, see my screen. Give me a thumbs up if we're good. good. Okay, very good. Thank you. A lot of this information I'm going to share with you, and I'll ask my expert colleagues from the health department, keep me honest if you see something different. But this was uh, fresh out of a Maryland Hospital Association call that I participated this morning on with uh, about 100 leaders from across the state, including Hopkins, UMS, et cetera. And the state of Maryland is setting some new records for cases and hospitalizations. I have some graphs that I'll go through shortly. Uh, we've reached daily levels with more than 10,000 cases and over 2,000 hospital, uh, hospitalizations. The seven-day positivity rate that was reported on the MHA call is 19.31% and uh, that places Maryland 10th on the uh, uh, list across the country in terms of new cases and hospitalizations. Not a record that we're proud of at this point. Uh, across LifeBridge, our in-house COVID positive uh, continues to be extremely high. We have over 200 cases in our facilities. This is as of yesterday. I, I don't have for the other entities today, but I will tell you our numbers have gone up again. I'll show you a graph on that as well. We are reinstituting most of the CDC guidance around uh, personal protective equipment that was initially laid out in waves one and two, specifically that N95s and eye protection are now required by our staff that are providing clinical interaction, that any plexiglass barriers that may have been removed are now being reinstalled in public facing areas. Our social distancing signage in all areas is being reinstalled as well. Our staffing is extremely challenged with the volumes, the acuity levels, staff shortages, etc. And uh, throughout these challenges, we continue to have uh, many of our partners experiencing the same level of challenge, be it transport, SNF placements, they're having their own share of, of challenges. The only thing that we have not reinstituted is further restrictions on our visitation policy at this point. And the main reason being, uh, we may need those family members to help be caregivers with us by bedside. Uh, and that is something that we're evaluating each day. I'll go on to the next slide. This is Maryland's new cases. You can see the spike uh, to the far right at 10,873 10, uh, new cases. This was as of December 28th. It has gone up further since that date. And there is the seven day positivity rate at 19.3%. Here's LifeBridge statistics. This is a stacked uh, trend line graph, if you will. The gray area indicates Carroll Hospital. That number shows 52. It's actually 56 COVID positive in-house this morning out of a census of 181. Keep in mind, we're licensed at 161 bed facility. Northwest at 61 and Sinai had 87. Uh, I know this number has increased among my sister facilities as well. Just to show you the volume of activity, uh, these are three separate graphs. What our 
typical average daily census or critical care unit and emergency department visits look like on a daily basis. These uh, bar graphs indicate each pay period over the last, I'll call it uh, 20 months. You can see that far left-hand side, the bar graph that is red, the vertical, as well as the horizontal red graph indicates pre-COVID volumes. Before we entered this pandemic, what were our typical daily volumes? That's that red bar graph that you're looking at. So as a point of reference, you can see our average daily census well above that pre-pandemic level. Our census this morning was 181 and, and we're starting virtually every day. Uh, 170s, 180s, we've been as high as 199. Uh, this morning it was 181. Our critical care unit our average daily census pre-pandemic was seven to eight patients per day. We're overflowing now. For the last several weeks, we've had 10, 12, 14. We have uh, several patients in IMC that are not in a critical care bed, but from a classification standpoint, they're critical patients. So you can see how we've exceeded. That's the middle graph that I'm referring to. Uh, that says CCU ABC average daily census. You can see we're at 14 right now. In our ED visits per day, uh, we were averaging right around 130 pre-pandemic. We are back at that volume. The difference this time is the acuity level and the number of COVID patients that we're seeing coming through the emergency department. So just a, uh, a snapshot of the level of activity that's occurring with several key indicators at your hospital. Uh, I know this is an eye chart, I apologize for this, but I wanna draw your attention. These are uh, three separate graphs in one view, October, November, December, that shows the number of vent days and isolation days and COVID positive patients. And just look at how this is trending. Unique vent patients and patient vent days in October 186 and unique vent pa patients of 34. In November, 203 total vent days, 45 unique vent patients. And now we've jumped up to 307 in December. And uh, I'm projecting we haven't peaked yet. I believe January is gonna be even more difficult. I don't see, I don't see us spiking uh, and peaking until the end of January. Total isolation days in December, 1,361, almost double what it was in November. So status uh, actually today instead of yesterday, health census 181, CCU still at 14, COVID positives have increased to 56. We have 11 vents that are in use. Uh, in the last 24 hours, we had 125 ED visits. We have 21 patients that are boarding in our ER, means they're waiting for a bed to free up. And quite honestly, we discharge about 25 to 30 patients per day. We get that many or more in admissions per day. So we're not gaining any ground in terms of capacity. We continue to operate on red and yellow alert on a regular basis. What does that mean for those who are not medical? Red means that the hospital has no monitor beds available in critical care, telemetry, or throughout the house that are all in use. And yellow means that the ED is temporarily requesting that we receive no patients in need of urgent medical care. So we are operating just like the majority of hospitals across the state on red and yellow on a regular basis. Our wonderful partners, our EMS, we've asked mm -hmm. them to go and reroute multiple times. Uh, Michael's team has done a fabulous job cooperating. Uh, we very, very rarely ask for reroute. So know that things are critical when that's happening. We continue to operate in phase two of our surge plan. What does that mean? Well, we have, we have separate phases. The, the phase two, we're implementing nurse extenders. These are nurses that may not have practiced bedside for many years. They may be in quality or in education or they're community navigators, care coordinators, or they may be actively working in our PACU, our OR, surgical services, or wound care, or cardiac rehab, any number of other outpatient areas. They are now being extenders on our units because we don't have a sufficient number of staff or resources 
to manage the volume of patients that we're dealing with. We have also implemented a reduction in our ORs. This has created some discussion across the state. Are we canceling all cases and doing emergent only? Not yet. I know that Governor Hogan is evaluating that, but we have reduced our capacity by 40% at Carroll Hospital. Our surgical leadership reviews cases every day based on emergent need, resource needs, bed availability. Are there going to be patients that will be admitted to critical care? All of those factors are evaluated on a daily basis. And unfortunately, there are certain elective cases that are being delayed or postponed because of those resource allocation restraints. What this happens, what this does is it frees up staff as well as PACU beds, uh, that's our post anesthesia care unit, post surgically. We overflow into that for medical needs because we don't have enough uh, capacity throughout the rest of the house. So we're using our, our PACU beds as monitor beds for other patients. And the other message I'll send out, and you know, we still have community members saying, you know, I can't get a test. So they show up to the emergency department, mildly symptomatic, requesting a COVID test. Please don't <clears throat> use the emergency department for testing needs. You know, I, I know that sounds like common sense, but you'd be amazed at how many patients show up on a daily basis asking to be tested. So I know that we're working with our health department colleagues and hoping to scale that up. We've also been reaching out <clears throat> for state support in order to do more aggressive testing. And I, I believe that's part of Dr. Wack and Sue's presentation, but I will pause there. That's the status of the hospital. I'm open to any questions. I do have a question for you. If we're continuing to operate on red and yellow alert, and yellow means that you're requesting to receive new patients in need of urgent medical care, other hospitals in the region have the same how far away do these patients have to go to get some, some care and how long does it take them to get there? Because you it says urgent yeah. medical care and if you gotta put them, it just, it just seems such a terrible situation. It is, it absolutely is and very rarely is it requested. It's probably a better question for Michael to answer but I will tell you that we have, uh, we have received patients as far away as West Virginia. Uh, we have sent patients to Hanover, to uh, York, to Gettysburg, wherever there's a, a critical care uh, bed available. And, and I can tell you that there is a state process called C4, Coordinated Care Division. Uh, it is locked up the majority of the time. Finding a critical care bed across the state of Maryland is extremely difficult right now. Hey, Garrett, thanks. And uh, I do have uh, backup for you. So uh, Mr. Robinson, um, if you can just uh, share with us your thoughts on Yes where we're at with uh, yellow and red? Um, certainly, and uh, Chris is gonna pull up some slides. In anticipation of this, I prepared a couple of slides. And okay. uh, let me just start out, um, first of all, at uh, 8.30 last night, um, after I had another event over at the Training Academy, I stopped by Carroll Hospital at the request of providers that were there. Uh, couldn't even get inside of the ER because they hold uh, ambulances in queue at the door to prevent additional contamination. I was met with uh, four of our county medic units and I quickly went around to check on the acuity of those patients. All four of them were what we call PUIs, uh, which basically are people that haven't been confirmed but are probable uh, COVID infections. Out of the four patients, all four of them uh, had temperatures as high as 104 degrees. They all had respiratory distress. They had low oxygen saturation levels. So I uh, proceeded from there to meet with a charge nurse. And again, uh, we put um, Carol on a um, reroute uh, status. And reroute supersedes red and yellow alert. And what it means essentially is um, that no one can come to the ER that you're to bypass everything and the purpose of that is to give them some uh, room to clear out patients. So I told the charge nurse we would start out with a three hour reroute. That's at now quarter to nine. So a little bit after midnight, I believe we went off of that status. So the challenge is to answer uh, the questions is where do we take patients at that point? Well, at the same time we did that, the next hospitals in our immediate catchment area, which are the LifeBridge facilities at Northwest and Sinai, 
as well as FMH, uh, Gettysburg, and Hanover, they're all in a similar status. So we have uh, gone beyond and uh, reached our critical mass um, status. There's nowhere else to take people. Um, watching the news this morning, I see that um, the hospital systems in uh, York, Pennsylvania, they're going to be getting some federal strike teams. And I had made that recommendation to MIMS, the state EMS, uh, several weeks ago at a meeting. And I don't know where they are on that. I believe they've requested some federal assets. But what we need is if simply Maryland calls in their assets, all that's going to do is rob from the nurses right. and the EMS people, and it's not going to accomplish anything. But Mike, if you can unpack this for a second. Yeah. So uh, what we're seeing is... What does MEMS stand for, and what is federal strike teams? Um, MEMS is Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems. So they're the state agency, which is a direct report to the governor that regulates EMS care to include things like hospital categorization. They maintain the red and yellow alert status system and everything else in between. So uh, we're meeting weekly with all the... Um, partners in the EMS community and the medical community and we're doing a call we had one yesterday and really no immediate um, solutions but I'll talk about some things that we're initiating uh, here in Carroll County. Um, first of all we're seeing an increase in responses of about 15 to 20 percent daily and uh, these calls and I know Chris Weinbrenner is putting together and coordinating among the health department, the hospital, and fire and EMS, uh, some press releases and some things that will be timely. We've got to get people to stop calling 911 and to stop coming to the emergency room because there is nowhere to put them. Um, on top of that, we're seeing some staffing issues, um, which right now uh, are all the burden of that is on the, the 13 companies that operate ambulances. And the challenges are is the majority of our people um, are part-time people. They work full-time for other regional fire departments, and they're either being held over in their jobs, they're being stressed out to the point that they don't want to work. So we potentially have a staffing crisis, and I'm working every day uh, with the CC visa people to try to head that off. And uh, there have been days when we're actually understaffed which means it might take two or three ambulances to make up one crew uh, on the scene. And that's something we just have to monitor. And uh, our contingencies basically are we're, we're working as much as we can, uh, but the, the critical nature of this is such that um, we're exhausting just about everything we can, and we might be looking for assistance. The strike teams are groupings of uh, health cast healthcare staffing, primarily nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, and even physicians that would be deployed through the Department of Health and Human Services in the form of what we call a DMAT team, Disaster Medical Assistance Team, essentially a self-contained hospital. And really where we need to be is we need more surge facilities. So if you call 911, all of our hospitals are on a reroute, we might take you downtown to the convention center where they've got a super ER set up, but the result of that, even though we're taking you 25 miles out of Carroll County, the result is in two or three hours they can do a comprehensive workup, provide you with some medications to take home, mm -hmm. and if they're uh, resource intensive, we can make that happen quickly. It may be that you need to place one of those in a tent outside of the ER, and that, that's a long-term uh, strategy. Um, hospital waiting times uh, for our ambulances and medic units, we had an issue the other day, a six-hour wait time. Uh, and talking to some of our partners in other jurisdictions, I found out this morning, uh, Baltimore Washington Medical Center in Glen Burnie, they had an ambulance that arrived last night from Anne Arundel County at 6.15. They got out of the hospital at 6.30 this morning. So over a 12-hour waiting time because they didn't even have a chair uh, to put that patient in. So, um, so this is like a kid with a broken arm from, like, like you know, uh, Commissioner Frazier, as we all know, is a okay wrestling coach. Right. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, says one of his kids or one of his opponent's kids, you know, dislocate the shoulder. Yeah, there you go. 
You're uh, a champion in my book. And then um, <laughs> is brought in by ambulance. They're now waiting in the ambulance for six hours before being seen? Potentially, yes. Okay. A and again, the other option is, is urgent care, and most of the urgent cares, because they've never experienced anything of this, they just don't have the capability for the processing right. and the logistics involved. So right. um, to me, the only option is, is we're going to have to set up some of these surge facilities at strategic locations in the state. Um, our other challenge, I don't know, Chris, can you advance this for me? If I may, Director Robinson, if we're having problems staffing what we already have, how are we going to staff the surge facilities? Do we need to call up the National Guard? What is the option? Do well, we the, na the National Guard, unfortunately, a lot of their medically trained people work as paramedics in right. fire departments or their nurses in ERs. So a state solution really is not going to accomplish a whole lot. We're to the point where we need, um, you know, political things to be turning for federal assets. And the federal assets are available. Like I said, Pennsylvania has some coming. Um, Maryland, I think, is trying to do that. Are you saying human resource assets? Yes, human resources, but also the logistics. Uh, in the post-9-11 world, uh, Maryland received lots of funding through the Urban Area Security Initiative. And there are capabilities even here in Carroll County to set up a surge facility. Um, but we need the human resources to staff uh, such a facility. Um, we're meeting this afternoon uh, with emergency management, and we've been meeting about two or three times a week just to look at things on a daily basis. Right here is yesterday afternoon. This shows Region 3, which is um, the Baltimore Standard Metropolitan Statistical Area. These are all the hospitals. I think it's 16 total, and there's the yellow alerts. Where you see the white lines, those are not applicable hospitals such as Johns Hopkins Peds, which doesn't fall into red and yellow alert, and the shock trauma center. These are the reroutes at that same time, and everything you see in gray, which is all the hospitals, means they're at maximum capacity. So it's not a question of, as, as Garrett elaborated, it's not a question of just doing some strategic initiatives. We're beyond all of that. Um, I've been doing this for 46 years and I have never seen anything of this level. This isn't like a, a hurricane or a tornado, which is time limited. Mm -hmm. We're looking now, especially with the Omicron variant, that given saturation events that occurred on Christmas, we're now starting probably yesterday and into this weekend going to see another surge mm -hmm. and then beyond that another surge. So this is something that may take 30 days to get under control, but the other trend that we're seeing, I know of at least two EMS providers right now in our system that are positive, and we don't know what else has been going on. I put out what's known as a general order this past Friday to all of the stations, and I talked to the CC Visa folks, making recommendations for mandatory social distancing in fire stations, mandatory masking, and um, highly encourage that uh, fire companies reevaluate uh, some of their fundraising events. So I spoke to the president of Reese on Friday, convinced them to cancel their bingo. They had an event last week with their election where they had 85 people in a room with the positive tested person. We set up an, op uh, an option for testing. So we're addressing all the things as they um, happen. But again, with this scenario that you see here, this is a daily basis. A um, couple initiatives that we're going to be um, putting in place. Chris, if I can get the next slide. And here's some data um, from December the 1st through December the 29th, um, just at Carroll Hospital, uh, 686 hours of red alert, 507 hours of yellow alert, and 31 hours of reroute, which is something that we initiate as the fire EMS once we go there and make a face-to-face. -face. So today we're going to begin an initiative uh, through the state called direct to triage which means when our patients come in on a stretcher we have a way if they're non-acute to put them in the ER almost immediately and that's a process I'm just waiting for MIMS to give us the opportunity to throw the switch and that will begin today and that will allow us to process 
our patients quicker, providing the ED has at least a chair to put them in, but quite frankly, they don't have that. I'm looking at um, having some additional stretchers out at the training academy where we can offload a patient, go pick up a spare stretcher, and then may maybe leave the stretchers behind with maybe one ambulance looking over two or three ambulances to try to get our people back on the street. So the turnover of our ambulances is a um, big issue and uh, Carol has been extremely cooperative. We're having a dialogue and again, as with any crisis, we're gonna be dealing with the human dynamics. Um, people are gonna be short fused. Um, last night I watched patients for a couple of minutes so one of our medic units could go out and sit on the picnic table at the ambulance unloading area and eat their lunch. And this was at nine o'clock. Right. So um, when you have people that aren't getting their basic human needs met, we start to have additional issues and it's a cascading effect uh, with everything else. So we have guidelines that are there. Uh, if I can see the next slide. And one of the things that we have that we've implemented is this is a checkoff sheet that when we go into a residence or into a facility and uh, if the patients are in the negative areas, then we recommend to them and we tell them you do not meet the criteria for transportation, we would like you to sign a refusal form. It's still up to that patient whether or not they wanna go. Um, so there may need to be some kind of a legislative initiative that you know, puts some controls uh, that are in place um, but that's probably not gonna be that possible because then we run into a whole lot of legal issues. Um, hospitals, obviously, and this is a long-term issue, things like tort reform would go a long way because somebody comes into a hospital in the midst of a pandemic, then there is a litany of things that have to be done um, in terms of medical procedures and things like that that people aren't gonna shy away from because of the liability involved. So. Bottom line is we're doing everything on our end. We're modifying procedures. We're working with the hospitals. And um, moving forward, uh, I'm gonna be meeting with the CC visa people. We're gonna have to look at other strategies. Um, it may be that we need to request, um, starting with our OEM making a request to MEMA to maybe get additional strike teams, which would be five ambulances at the advanced life support level and a leader, we might pre-deploy them somewhere like our training academy, at least during daytime when we see our surge, and those five ambulances or 10 ambulances, and there are federal assets in place to bring up to 1,000 ambulances and medic units into a region. Uh, they did this in the Metro New York area two summers ago when the first surge occurred. So we're looking at all options, and again, our bottom line is, is to provide consistent service to the citizens so when they call 911, we can have an immediate response, uh, be timely, and provide a consistent quality of care. So that's our bottom line. So and what I was going to ask is, what you're seeing is some of this is direct effects of COVID-19. Yes. You're seeing. But a lot of what you're describing are really the secondary effects. Yes. of COVID-19 that the hospital is at capacity because of the 56 COVID-19 patients that are there now. Correct, and the, and the net effect in the community is doctor's offices are refusing to see certain patients, the urgent cares are overloaded, and one of the key elements, and we're working on that through Chris, is between the health department, the hospital, and EMS, is getting the public education element out there. So yes, we know you have COVID, but there's nothing medically available in a hospital that's any different from a patient staying at home. So the home isolation, and again, people knowing when to pull the trigger because the level of acuity increases. So they start to have a significant fever. They're having trouble breathing, which is becoming more and more difficult and with that other signs and symptoms. However, the 56 that are in the hospital, and Gary, if you can answer this one for me, those are those that are in critical need that need to be in the hospital. Uh, Gary, do you have a breakdown of the 56 <clears throat> that are in the hospital? Um, 
you know, the demographics of those 56? Uh, just shine uh, a little bit of, you know, light on that. That's a very good uh, question you posed I, there. I do. Give, give me a second and I'll, I'll bring it up. Hold, hold on a second. Let's come back to that question. We do take a look at the age cohort. I will say this, this latest uh, Omicron variant is affecting a younger population, mm -hmm. at least what we're seeing. Uh, we actually had uh, a 40 and a 41 year old that were both in our critical care unit um, pass away this past week. So it is affecting a younger population. Um, uh, move on to the next topic and let me dig up some of my data here. I can share. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, go ahead, Mike, can we continue. Or did you have more? Yeah, just our, our other issue, and I'm, I'm doing a preemptive strike on that, is our potential for supply chain issues. Um, fortunately, Carroll County's been proactive and we have a huge stockpile of PPE, but that may not be our critical area. Um, an example is during my time at the hospital last evening, one of our medic units went through two oxygen cylinders. We typically don't even use a single cylinder on a call. We have piped in oxygen in the ambulances, um, so we've verified with our suppliers oxygen something that they can manufacture quickly. Um, the other part of this is things like medications and particularly those to support respiratory effort. Um, we have a contract with Carroll Hospital. I talked with their um, incident commander. They've gone into the incident command system there and she's checked with the pharmacy. They're checking with their suppliers. Um, another area that we have is the monitoring of respiratory status. The probes that we use, I contacted our vendor and they're looking at a national shortage of a probe for a device that we have called n CO2 monitoring, which tells you how well you're ventilating and what other things we need to do. There's a potential for a nationwide shortage of that particular item and there may be other things coming. So again, as uh, Commissioner Rothstein alluded to, this has a significant cascading effect uh, upon other areas, including supply, including human resources, and then our whole ability to protect uh, the environments that we're in. And, you know, as more people get affected, um, people are simply going to be calling out, not showing up to work. And, and again, the continuing impact from this. I was told that pulse, that you mentioned pulse ox. I was told that um, pulse ox at a very low saturation and people don't even know they're at a, such a low saturation. Yes, pulse and that, as a former COVID patient, I had my own pulse ox and yeah. uh, I know when I sat at home last year with it, I went down to a, a dangerously low level where most people would have gone to the hospital. Right. So the, the reality to that is people are maybe in a critical condition at home, they don't know it, so we've got to be very careful with our public education message that we aren't deterring people from calling 911 and coming to the hospital when they reach that level of acuity where they need to cross over and get some professional assistance. Right. Uh, that's what I'll share. Any questions? Um, I, I just have one question here. Uh, a lot of times COVID is not the initial uh, infection. Sometimes it's a secondary infection. And I know we have flu and other <coughs> things going in the community. Um, you know, if somebody becomes infected with that, the immune system becomes uh, compromised and they come in contact with COVID and it really hits them. Is that happening with a lot of these? Are you uh, seeing yeah, that? Yeah, we, uh, what we're seeing in the trends is most of these people are, and I'll use that word sparingly because I think I'm in that category, you know, they're senior level people. Um, a lot of people are coming from our nursing facilities, which is also becoming problematic because I think the nursing and extended care community could do a lot more in place versus referring these patients. We had a call in Westminster last night. Somebody had a failure of a urinary catheter, but that failure had been going on for four days. Mm. And they're calling 911 at 10 o'clock at night. So more could be done in those facilities. But um, Commissioner Weaver, you're right on target. We have what are known as comorbidity factors. So the average person reaches an age and a large population uh, percentage at a certain age is type 2 diabetics. They have COPD, including emphysema and asthma, which are significant comorbidity factors. 
Um, on top of that, we have the flu and the cold season. So again, prevention, vaccinations, we can't say enough about that. So we have people that are chronically ill, and on top of that, they now get the COVID uh, viral strain, either Omicron, Delta, whatever it may be, and that complicates things to the point that they think it may be their regular health condition. Now they're waiting, they get very sick, and now they're calling us. Right. What about the younger uh, generation, 20-year-olds, uh, 30-year-olds? We're well, not seeing many. Seeing many. Because most of them have very um, good immune systems, um, a lot of them have some resistance, so a lot of them are probably getting it, and they're never getting tested. They may be spreading it, but they're staying where they are in the workplace. Um, you know, and I'll use our EMS population as an example. Most of those uh, people engaged in EMS are in a younger category, 40 years of age, and down to 16 years of age, they have higher uh, levels of immunity, they're active, uh, nutritional things, all those uh, factors are in place that they're probably more resistant. And we also are overlooking the fact of people that may have had COVID that have that built-in immunity and we're really underestimating that um, and, and not really taking advantage of the fact that while some of those people may not be vaccinated, they have natural immunity. And so, I don't want to put you too much on the spot. We do have health department. We got yeah, you've got experts out there. Dr. Wag, no, you're absolutely an expert in there. Yeah. Your 46 years of experience says a lot. Um, but we do have Dr. Wack and Sue on as well that can probably address those specifics um, directly. Um, and also, you know, Derek can share with us uh, again, the demographics, the numbers as far as the ages and things like that that are in the hospitals uh, or in the hospital right now. Um, so, anything else, you know, what would, what, I don't want to say terrifies me, but it really does is the supply chain um, concerns. I mean, probes and other things that you would typically need and use in transport or life saving measures are now in. It's, it's, it's all terrifying. You don't have to supply. You people that are that have some urgent medical needs might not be able to go to the hospital here, might be transported 40 miles, 25 miles away, all that transport time. I mean, things can happen there. I just, it's all just a cascading effect. And it's, yes. it's, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. That's why we're meeting to get this information right. and see if we can help mitigate this in any way because this is a crisis and it has, we, have to be, we have to deal with this crisis. Director, I am thoroughly impressed with your leadership on this. The same with President Hoover. These briefings are fantastic for the public. I wanted to ask, have we lost anyone while in our transportation and custody as emergency services? So are we good with maintaining? When we have someone waiting, we haven't lost anyone, have we? Uh, no. I mean, obviously we have some critical patients that we may transport in respiratory failure, respiratory arrest. Or while, while they're in our custody, we haven't lost anyone as of to date, correct? Um, no, other than people that have other medical conditions gotcha. that normally. But, but if you're happen. measuring something by death, I think we have a problem. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I, I just want to make I, sure I, I haven't got to that point. No, but right. Which if, is we're good. Measuring, Which is good. if we're measuring death, that's one thing. If we're measuring people that are unfortunately are getting sicker because of delays right. and because yeah. of uh, more anxiety and angst and um, frustration uh, of loved ones and others, especially during this time, that's another category. And that, you know, uh, hits us all personal. I mean, I, I've shared it before, you know, my others, they, they don't die, but they go through situations that they shouldn't have to go through because of this. Right. So me measuring death is not the measuring stick that yeah, I would it's use. Something we don't want to ever get well, to. It's, our ultimate goal is to save lives. Yes. And just as a final comment, Commissioner Frazier summed it up, is we're in a crisis. There's nothing to define. There's nothing to discover. The data is there. What we now need to do is be proactively um, in a continuous quest for solutions as this progresses to the next level. And um, what I want to say is, and as a newcomer to Carroll County government, is I'm very impressed with the collaborative effort that's going on between health department, um, the LifeBridge health system, 
emergency management, fire, EMS, the sheriff, everybody is working in partnership. And I can tell you from the perspective of my office is we're working every day, every hour to assure that things are being met. And we need to maintain that collaboration and uh, along with that, you know, manage the stress levels and maintain our composure because without effective leadership, and I commend you all for your initiative, without your leadership to drive this, uh, we're going to have even more significant problems. So, well, Thank you. But you guys are the experts, and we need to listen to you. What I'd like to do is, um, Sheriff, if you want to come on up, and then we'll uh, take it home before open discussion with the health department. Right. Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get that. Um, yeah, uh, Garrett, before I uh, hand it off to the sheriff, um, if you can break down the numbers, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I do have some data. Unfortunately, I don't have yesterday's data, but I can tell you in aggregate, uh, of all the COVID patients this past year that we have taken care of, 22% were in the age 60 to 69 category, 16% were in the 50 to 59 category age cohort, 10% were in the 40 to 49 age cohort, another 10% were 39 or under, and the remaining 40, or whatever that is, 43% are 70 and above. So it, it's, it's affecting all age cohorts. Uh, I'm still trying to get the data on what was yesterday's age breakdown. Uh, I just want to echo, and then I'll, then I'll be quiet, but thank you for asking. Uh, echo Michael's comments about the uh, supply challenges. We, we have a very robust global supply chain team that works at LifeBridge and we're seeing shortages in areas that I never would have anticipated. Blood collection tubes, uh, mm. citrate tubes, feeding products, testing kits, uh, you name it. it it's, it's really a challenge uh, from a supply standpoint right now. The, um, the numbers, uh, vaccinated, unvaccinated, as far as uh, what you're seeing? Last time I looked at it, and it wasn't this week, it was a couple of weeks ago, 85% were unvaccinated. The 15% that are having a right flu, uh, most of them uh, did not receive a booster. I don't know the exact percentage. Uh, but there are some breakthrough cases that are occurring, about 15% that have been vaccinated. Typically, most of those individuals have other comorbidity or complications that exacerbate the problem. Yeah, okay, I appreciate it. Um, sure. Steve, did you have uh, something? Commissioner uh, Wentz? Yeah, that, that was my question. Uh, you know, we're skating around the, the, the very fact of, of the burden that's being put on our first responders and um, our, our nurses and doctors and et cetera, et cetera, uh, with the very fact that that huge number of people are unvaccinated, uh, which leads to the point of, you know, uh, asymptomatic, uh, being able to stay at home. Uh, and, and, you know, those facts, I believe, are critically needed so that we can make right decisions here. Uh, and I appreciate that. And I also want to point out, while I appreciate Mike Robinson's uh, incredible report there, Let's not forget the fact that 75% of the folks that we're talking about on our first responder group are volunteers. So they're actually doing this on their own and putting their own health at risk and not getting any compensation for that whatsoever. I don't want to get that lost in the fact. Uh, but those two things I, I want to point out and um, vaccinated versus unvaccinated is a huge issue. Yeah, really, really well said. I appreciate it. Also, um, the 911 callers and the entire team that it makes or takes for actions to happen. It's not just one or the other, but it's, you know, from, like you said, Mike, the collaboration you have with the Sheriff's Department, the transport, the 911 caller to get you there, transport to the hospital, and move on from there. But uh, good points. Um, Sheriff, uh, if you can just share with us you know, your thoughts on what's going on. And uh, again, if you're seeing some of the challenges. I think Steven, also. you touched on a little bit. One of the challenges for Mike, myself, Garrett, anybody that's 24 seven, 365 is keeping our staff healthy so that they can respond. And it's not only staff, but it's the family members that 
are at home when staff gets there and they become sick. So um, I run two large 24-7, 365 operations, the detention center and then law enforcement for the county with some other entities, the courthouse and, and um, other, other smaller units within the county. And the struggle has been keeping my staff healthy so that they can respond to, to these calls. And I, I think that um, we've learned an awful lot over the last year and a half to make sure that um, we keep our deputies and, and uh, in the jail and, and out on the road healthy, their families. And so uh, uh, I'll start with law enforcement. We're, we're stressed, there's no two ways about it, but we're in very good shape and, and we're responding effectively. There's no diminished manpower um, within law enforcement. Some of the municipalities have had some issues with COVID and, and some of their officers. You can imagine a, a smaller jurisdiction with five or 10 officers that, that might have uh, two, three, four or five go down that it completely uh, knocks them out. So we've been able to step in and help those jurisdictions with our manpower. And so um, there's, there's really, uh, the, the, uh, there, is, there is stress within in law enforcement, but I will tell you that if you're someone that thinks that we're, we're weak right now, and that this is a place to come and either commit a crime or if you live in this county and you want to commit a, commit a crime, you're sadly mistaken um, because not only will we come out and arrest you, but I have a jail that's open to accept you <laughs> and I will accept you. And so I, I don't want anybody to think that there's any panic that's going on in our community. Um, there are other jurisdictions around us that are suffering greatly that, that uh, uh, there is some panic, but here I, I, I assure you that that is not, that is not the case. But sure. I will tell you that this, okay. this real quickly, this can't happen unless I have quality relationships with health department, with Garrett's crew, um, with Mike's crew, with everybody <coughs> that's emergency management that, that, that helps me acquire um, the, the protective gear, everything that I have. The one thing that we've done over the last year um, that has really um, kind of kept us in the game uh, is the ability to test and um, determine whether someone is uh, asymptomatic, symptomatic, and um, pulse oxes are something that we have. Um, I have a great staff that, uh, that you can imagine, and, and fire and police are, are all, all together in this. I do have people that moonlight as paramedics and, and uh, EMTs. I have a risk management, Greg Dodds is my EMT that, that does a lot of testing, and one of the things we'll do is we'll throw pulse ox on people just to check their oxygen level, just to see if see if they are someone that needs some, some critical care, but to manage our, our staff so that they aren't overwhelming hospitals um, has been key to keeping us in the fight, both in the jail and, and out on the road. Did you have something? There? That's what I was gonna ask you, if you had enough PPE and testing to, to keep moving forward so that your, yeah. your people are safe. So the, the, one of the things that is difficult to get your hands on is rapid tests. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the public is starting to realize that rapid tests are are difficult PCRs are now taking a little longer for us to get back. Um, so, so we're we're dealing with symptomatic deputies, and we're also working with their families also. Because if I send a deputy home, and and they're with family, and they believe they have COVID, then I can't get that deputy back to work. So we will go to houses that are uh, of our deputies and test and make sure that uh, um, that that there's there's not that COVID issue there. We also test for influenza with the the rapid kits that we have. Those rapid kits aren't cheap. Um, we constantly are ordering hundreds at a time because we're going through them quickly, but it is one of the single things today that has kept us operating and in the fight so that there is no panic and, and they're not rushing to a hospital just asking for a test or to a pharmacy just asking for a test. Our, our jail is open. Um, that is probably the place that, that has stressed us the most. You can imagine um, it's about a, a little over 40,000 square foot that building is. 150 inmates and a revolving 100 um, or so with staff that's in and out. We've um, restricted just about everything except for um, the health department and our medical staff and obviously our kitchen support that comes in and out of the jail. Um, I think you guys remember a couple weeks ago I uh, presented a video visitation system that mm -hmm. we're in the process of implementing and that will help ease the stress of the inmates that need to communicate with their with their families and that that's been the biggest stress you know the jail itself is old um i think i've told all of you this it's not built for 2021 corrections but man is it built for 2021 pandemic because it's small housing units um, that only have 10 15 people in them each housing unit 
and I can move people around strategically once I accept them into the jail and um, I can quarantine them in smaller housing units before I transition them into the larger population that has been quarantined for a period of time. So we've been extremely successful with keeping the virus out of the jail with the inmate population because I have no intention of opening the door and just letting inmates out. They're there for a reason and my intent is to keep them there but part of my job is to make sure that that building stays very healthy. And they've done a wonderful job, the deputies have over there. Um, we have a mask mandate within the jail and not just a mask mandate. Right now, you either wear an N95 or a KN95. Um, we believe those are the most effective masks for what we're doing. We have hand, hand sanitizing stations, um, uh, scanning and, and, and assessments before you come in. So the jail is operating at, at capacity and, and uh, we're, we're very successful there. But, I, but again, just to reiterate that, that Garrett's staff, I know he goes through this. Um, he's not telling you this, but he's struggling with, with his personnel also to keep them healthy. Um, Mike is, uh, everybody that's doing this is struggling to keep their, their people healthy so that they can go out and serve other people. And, and that's important for the public to understand that we're all working together to do that. Um, but understand when these folks come to your house or they're responding or you go to a hospital that, that the folks there are struggling also to, to stay healthy and their families as well. The, um, <clears throat> going, going back to the tests, I mean, is it a weekly basis? I mean, you're, you're ordering these rapid tests. We do, yeah. I mean, we're, we've been ordering them for months just to get our hands on the rapid and the ability to have the equipment so that we can test. Right. Um, you know, we, we do use North Carroll High School, our police academy, yep. which is a good open air place to have people respond and do tests. Um, Greg's up there now. He was up there yesterday. He seems to be up there every day <laughs> and gets calls yep. from people that say, that say, I'm symptomatic, I want to be tested. I get a, a briefing from him every day on who's, who's COVID positive, who was tested whether they're sym symptomatic or not. And then we have policies and procedures on how we quarantine them, when we bring them back. And um, it, it is a system that we've perfected over the last year so that we can keep our folks in the game and not create panic within our own ranks. And that's been very successful, a, a key to doing it. One last thing, so I do have, I, I have no problems with telling people I'm vaccinated and boosted. I, I believe in it. I think it's, it's important to have. Um, I, I certainly respect an individual's rights, but I do have um, the ability to vaccinate any of my deputies that come to me 24 seven um, <laughs> because we have a robust medical staff in the jail. We have those things on hand through the health department so we can vaccinate individuals that, that want the vaccine. And so that's been a, also a key because people, um, they're around others and they're like, well, I guess it, it, it may be better for me to do that. and they. They come to me and they don't have to wait in a line anywhere. They can come straight into our detention center and get the vaccine. So self-containment has been very, very key and not, not necessarily relying on anybody else to, to, to try and keep us healthy. It's, it's been containment of ourselves. And getting vaccinated before you get sick. Yeah, is key. yeah. I mean, yeah we got a lot of, I've got process. a lot of folks that say, well, can I get it while I'm in the hospital? And unfortunately, it's just simply too late by right. then by that time so <clears throat> sheriff is the test saying part of the procedure of admitting an inmate you like your screen them for to admit yeah. it yeah oh, good yeah. now Absolutely. once they're in do they have the ability to request yes immunization yes good um and, and I, I don't know the exact number but it's in the high 80s that that we have vaccinated with within the jail and and you know early on there was a little bit of grumbling about why are you why are you you know inoculating inmates well the, the reason i'm doing it is so i don't have to open the door and let people people out and 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 it, and it keeps them healthy and um it keeps the courts off my back from saying what's going on in the jail and I have a wonderful relationship with the state's attorney's office the courts we speak regularly about the population in the jail and so um uh one of the other things is that the courts are are delaying any jury trials mm -hmm. and they're they're really buckling down on their operations which stresses my operation significantly because right. mm -hmm. i've got to move people to and from the courts and the longer they delay someone from being on trial the bigger my population gets right. within the detention center so you're faced with the same stress as president hoover is without a doubt yeah i mean it if, if you know his his job is to get people healthy and get them back out the door um uh <laughs> 
you have to keep them I for keep, months or even years potentially. And if and if I and if I do, then my my population swells significantly, and then I don't have a place to put them. So, um, but right now we're fine. That's that's simply not an issue um, on law enforcement or or with the detention center. Those are not issues. When you say you're vaccinating in the high 80s, what do you mean? The MA population itself. So 80 percent. Um, I would oh, say probably I could get you better numbers for that, but but we have a high a high yeah. concentration of inmates that are that are inoculated. Okay, that's what yeah. I was wondering because yeah. I thought it meant 80 people we vaccinated or what? No, I sure. no, okay. I, I don't know what the number is this morning. I didn't look at it, but we're staying in the 140s, um, low 140s with population on a daily population, and we have put out to um, not only my deputies but local law enforcement and state police that if there's the ability to write a citation, a criminal citation for someone, as opposed to, to arresting them, bringing them into the jail, if they're local, if we can, we can find them uh, easily, if they, they abscond, then, then, then let's do that. Um, and, and there's a ton of cooperation there. There's no issues there at all. You two have been very reassuring. Um, in spite of what we're faced with, it's very reassuring to the public to know that you guys are in command and have a full understanding of the situation we're faced with. But Eric, it, there's no two ways about it. You have to have <laughs> department heads and elected leaders working together 24-7, 365. If you don't, there's a breakdown somewhere. You throw Garrett into it, you throw uh, Sue and Dr. Wack into it. We talk to them regularly. And it's a unique concept here. It just simply works, and we know what each other's doing. But there's a ton of cooperation. If I don't have it, um, I call Mike or I'll call somebody to get it. And if I have it, I'll give it to you so that we can we can keep everybody healthy and stay in the fight. If we're not in the fight, then then there's there's panic. No, but it's that's not it's well said. And uh, you know, um, again, I, I don't want to give uh, Commissioner Wentz so much credit. I'm talking <laughs> about transparency, but. The importance of this communications um, it doesn't make it easier you know it, I mean it, it's a tool to get things done but the fact is we are in a crisis we are in a log jam you know you know like you said uh, the the hospital is a critical um, we're gonna hear from uh, the health department on uh, the numbers that they see and how to what they recommend to mitigate these challenges because something's got to give and you know, I mean, it's it's a balloon that's overfilled right now, and we just don't want to see it pop. So um, keep working together. Take care of your people. Ex exactly, Commissioner Wentz. <clears throat> just a quick question, uh, Jim. You mentioned that you're you're utilizing N95s and the uh, you know the masks that are certainly looked upon as being the best. Are you having a situation with a shortage on them, or is the supply Good chain question. there for masks? Good. Uh I, I, I'll tell you the numbers I've got. I have no problems with telling you. I'm sitting on about 12,000 KN95s okay. and about 9,000 uh, N95s, and I've, and I've got a ton of the dailies. But, but uh, um, I went into a state in the jail where um, we're going to use a lot more Ks, and, and, um, and we're going we're gonna to go through that, and we're constantly ordering so that we keep, mm -hmm. up, we keep up with that because we feel in that environment You've got to wear those masks um, so that we can get through this this variant and, and hopefully be successful. So I have the supplies, and it's only because we were able to order them and be proactive with with getting them. If I gave that to Mike and, and the fire departments, they go through that in a week. What what I have, um, but for me, uh, I have it, and then I do also support the the local police departments that need support if they can't get their hands on PPE like that or gloves or or other things so so i have it but i'm going through it so better be careful director robinson might come well, knocking on your door yeah now that he's told me about this twelve thousand <laughs> yeah. so yeah no secret uh, i have no i have no problems with telling people how things go and what we're doing and um but yeah. but uh but we're here we're here to support and help and and uh, i think collectively that takes place yeah i think um as we move on we're going to have the conversation what else do you need and what else can we do, you know, from our role uh, for you? So, um, I see a couple of EMS here. Uh, it's probably worthwhile getting some of the boots on the ground conversation on what's going on from your perspective. Um, now, are you speaking individually or from uh, EMS? Uh, it would be, I, I just spoke to uh, 
one of the uh, the leaders. Well, but say 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 it, it, it would be. Well, I'm sorry. Introduce yeah. yourself first. Uh, Michael Karolinko. Uh I would just be speaking today, obviously, as a uh, as an EMS uh, fire EMS career member at large of the county, uh, and not representing obviously the, any of the departments I work for or any other uh, roles right now. But uh, I can speak clearly from the I guess the experience that we're in the midst of right now, pretty clearly. So. Okay. So with that said, um, share with us just for you know a few minutes. Sure. Your your thoughts uh, not to have a conversation. If we have a conversation, it'll be after this sure. occurs. Go ahead. Well, uh, it's just I, I think you know one of the things that we've really highlighted in the last little bit, um, and you know conversations with the director and otherwise is uh, we're historic for you know historic standards at this point. Um, it's the challenges, and I think the daily demands. Obviously, we're, we're seeing at the ER our relationship with everybody that's there. We're seeing the demands on those individuals, but. I think especially here in the county, we're, we're seeing the wear and tear of, uh, of our individual members that are out there going day to day, uh, trying to take care of the citizens. And, uh, you know, the, the call volume, I think, you know, varies per day. Um, there's days that, you know, I, I work at slower stations and busier stations, and uh, even the slower stations, I'm not seeing the firehouse for the majority of the day. Um, that's, that's atypical. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of sick individuals right now. Obviously, there's a lot of stress, so uh, the transition, um, you know, the, the the need to work, the need to be able to be compensated and, and you know, and obviously support our families in the little bit we make here in the county. Um, so you have those stresses that are always residual. <coughs> but at the same time, um, you know, given all the other circumstances, it's just been, it's been a, a demanding experience. Um, you know, I, I heard, no, Commissioner uh, Wance has said about you know the 75 percent are volunteers, and I think that they're doing the best that they can to support us, and I appreciate that from the organizational side and from the day-to-day -day operations. Um, I think that it's fair to say uh, across the board that uh, that EMS is supported of, uh, uh, upwards of well over 90 percent by the career staff. We're bearing the load of this right now. Uh, it's difficult. Um, well, I, I, we're exhausted. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep being here for Carroll County. Um, we're not going away, and uh, you know I think everybody's pretty resolute in that. But you know we're to the point where, you know, when you're 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 at the ER for five or six hours trying to get rid of a patient, you know there's at least a sense of community where you're ordering pizza and trying to feed each other and hmm. get through it. But uh, you know it, we can't understate the str the struggles that we're in right now, and uh, we're going to continue to be here for the county and and continue to. To do what's right but we also look for for your support you know in this moment and moving forward we needed the support and uh change in july last year um you know circumstances are where they are um but obviously we need the support moving forward and uh, it would have been really nice to have a little bit more structure and ability to be able to absorb what's happening in the county right now but uh it is what it is um mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned uh we'll continue operating with how we have to um i will say uh Hands down, well, having Director Robinson here has been, um, I guess, game-changing game for a lot of what's been happening. Um, we've been seeing him in the in the ER, like last night, uh, you know, showing up the ER while we have units that are frozen in place, not being able to offload patients for hours. Uh, actually, ended up in Gettysburg at that point uh, with the patient, and you know, it, it's it's at least seeing that active leadership, that engaged leadership, has been. Uh, a, a world of difference from that county level and okay. having that direction you know seeing the general orders and everything else has been great so i do appreciate the opportunity yep. for you absolutely thank, thank you, you. Thank you okay um dr wack uh sue why don't you uh come on screen or whoever if it's going to be both of you or one of you um hello ms doyle and i think uh rob's there somewhere i saw yes okay um Give me a little bit of an update about what we know, and okay. then I'm going to talk about some changes at the health department, and I'm going to talk about what we're trying to implement in the community. Um, so right now, Omicron is uh, the dominant strain that we're seeing in the community. Um, there's some early evidence that that strain is not as severe. People are not getting as sick, but we don't know that right now, um, how that's going to source out because you know it takes about two weeks lag time for us to be looking at this 
um, the most effective way to lessen the impact and decrease the needs and the transmission of the communities through vaccination. We are expanding our vaccination clinics in the county. We're going to be moving to Carroll Community College um, so that we can vaccinate more individuals. Um, one of uh, my colleagues put out, um, you know, that it's probably too late for people who um, have not been vaccinated to be safe during this surge. But if you have been vaccinated and you've not been boosted, it'd be a really great idea to come and get boosted uh, now. Now is the time. Um, you know, vaccinations are effective. They're effective against all of the variants right now. Um, we want to make sure that people understand it. that's fine if you've had COVID and you think you have some natural immunity, but there are studies out there that show that about a third of the people don't get any immunity um, or have any immunity just from having COVID. Um, so getting vaccinated after that, it also um, ensures that you're um, uh, safe from all the variants. Um, COVID infection is followed by a double risk of reinfection. Um, you know, the side effects of having COVID not vaccinated are a lot worse than if you have COVID and you've been vaccinated. I sit here as somebody who had three full shots because I'm immunocompromised and I was exposed to a family member who had COVID and I got COVID. But I can share with you that what I had was no more than a common cold. Um, actually, I think every cold I've ever had was more severe than the symptoms that I had. But, you know, I stayed home. <clears throat> Um, thankfully, I wear my mask religiously at work. I spent three hours in a vehicle with two of our employees. We were all masked. Not one person that I was in contact here at the health department was infected by me because of that. Um, so, you know, we are increasing our security at the health, uh, at the health department. And I want to make everybody aware of that and what we're doing. We're going back to curbside service and appointment only services. Um, I need the workforce that I have. I probably have like six or seven people right now with COVID. Um, and I, I need to, to safely have a workforce so that we can do what we need to do in, in the community. Um, there's gonna be some changes. We have about 130 restaurants that did not uh, renew their licenses yet. That time has come. It needs to be done by the end of the week. So if you come to the health department, there'll be a tent outside. We are gonna be providing those services outside we can't have 130 people in the health department in those close quarters and keep our workforce safe. Um, we've implemented um, KN, uh, KN95s here. Um, we're recommending double masking if you're using a surgical mask. Um, in the health department, we have told all of our employees, no cloth mask, if you wanna wear a cloth mask, needs to be over a surgical mask at a minimum. Um, Let's see, what else do I want to address? I also want to address the new CDC guidance. I just want people to understand that the CDC guidance, they were trying very hard to adjust the guidance to be able to function in this surge. That that guidance um, was because we're in unprecedented times, we're seeing record numbers of cases, and that that guidance is to protect our healthcare workforce, and that they sent out the bare bones and they have not sent out um, the update on the guidance. So the state of Maryland has questions that they've submitted to the CDC. We are continuing in the state of Maryland to follow the old guidance until they get their answers. Um, I also want to point out to people that um, the CDC is saying it may take them some time and they're not sure of their timeline to actually get the updated variants, various guidance documents out to everybody. So really what we were trying to do is protect our healthcare workforce and say that if you're asymptomatic, um, you can reduce your uh, time in, in isolation and then mask and come back so that we have a workforce that can address these needs. Uh, let's see what else is going on. So I talked about moving to um, the community college to do vaccinations so that we can increase the number of people that we're seeing. Uh, we were creating quite a mess at the health department. We can only see about 60 to 80 people a day. Um, hopefully at the college, we'll be able to increase that to two or 300. Addition, in addition to that, I just received an email while we're sitting here that we have secured the Ag Center for drive-through testing. We're hoping to have that up by next week. Um, we will be working with emergency management 
and uh, we will be requesting other resources, mostly manpower. So I, I apologize, Sue. Um, you, you got uh -huh. cut off when you said Ag Center. Say that one more time. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I, um, I so can. We, we you just froze for a second. Okay. We had secured the Ag Center, and we will be doing testing for right now, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We're hoping from 9 to 1, and we'll be able to get two to 300 individuals through. Um, last week, we tried to meet the demand in testing at the health department. We allowed and opened up to people with no appointments to come. Um, we created a little bit of traffic jam. Shout out to uh, Westminster PD for coming and helping. Um, we did test 253 people that day. This is just not the area that we can continue to do those services in. Um, we're working with the lab to make sure that we can get enough test kits. And we have staff right now who have identified what our needs are and I will be sending out you know, requests for that assistance um, so that we can try to meet the needs of the community. Um, the Ag Center seems to be the logical place. That's where we were before. Um, shout out to Garrett. We um, had staff go over there to see if there was something we could do at the hospital to increase testing, but that just was going to be create another traffic jam. So um, I kind of defer to Dr. Wack to chime in and add anything that I've missed or anything that he really wants to hit the highlights on. Thanks, Sue. Um, uh, you, you pretty much hit all the highlights. There's just one one additional point I'd like to make. And uh, Chris, if you could uh, give me the screen, I'll share uh, the latest from the... Um, you have it. Is that... I just got a thing. It said accessibility preferences, Chris. Is that them? Um, is that you giving me access? That's correct. Oh, can you do it again? Because I closed it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're still the presenter. Just uh, click on the screen at the very bottom. It says share screen. Yeah, it's saying open system preferences. So I don't know if I have to do that, or can I just go ahead and? Uh, you should right. be fine. Can you see this? No. Not yet. All right. What do you see? You. Nothing. Uh, we'll see you. Hold on. I'm sorry. Go to meeting. Oh, here we go. Uh, I'm sorry. It's an Apple thing. I got to... <laughs> Aha. Yeah, here it goes. Okay. Hope that should do it. Oh, now it's asking me to restart. So maybe this might be easier to if somebody else just pulls it up. It, it go to the uh, coronavirus.maryland.gov. It's the the um, the dashboard. Well, I can just describe you what I was going to show you, but you know, they say a picture is worth a lot of words. Um, you know, when you look at the evolution of this pandemic since the beginning, we've been through these surges, and each surge has a kind of a, a shape to it. You know, there's an initial ramp up, there's an accelerating phase, then there's a decelerating phase, a plateau, and then it and then it ends, and then we get a little break, and then we're on to the next surge. If you put the, the uh, hospitalization data, ah, there you go, <laughs> perfect. So uh, yes, yeah, so see the, the um, positivity graph. If you could hit that little arrow at the bottom on the lower right of the positivity graph on the right and go over to deaths. One more, uh, one more, there you go. So perfect, thank you. So um, you can see the shape of the, of the prior outbreaks, and then you can also see that the deaths um, followed those surges. You know, with each surge, there was a, a, a surge in the deaths. And um, we peaked out with each prior surge around 50 deaths a day. Um, and then if you fast forward to the far right of the hospitalization graph, you can see that curve is, still accelerating. It's getting steeper. It's not 
it's not bending. It's not starting to decelerate and plateau, which tells us that we're still not close to the peak of this thing. Um, and yet the hospital system, as Mr. Hoover has related in great painful detail, and Mr. Robinson regarding the EMS, we're at capacity today, and yet we still have a long way to go before this thing peaks out. And then in terms of the mortality, even if Omicron <clears throat> turns out to be less severe, although that's still an open question, we are already at 40, 30 deaths a day. We're very quickly, if these patterns hold, we're gonna blow past 50 deaths a day in the not too distant future. And so there's significant mortality ahead of us. Um, and yet our hospital system is already at capacity. And, and I think that the, the you know, sort of the, the conversation we've had here about, on the one hand, some of the commissioners have said that we're terrified, and I think that's an appropriate response, but then I think uh, Sheriff Luis is correct that we can't panic. And, I, and that is, you know, for those of you uh, that have been in the military, that's been sort of a definition of bravery is being terrified, but still being able to do the right thing. And so uh, the system is, is near collapse. We know this because this has all been modeled before in terms of uh, what would happen during a, a pandemic. And we've known that our healthcare system has limits. Um, we are approaching those limits. Um, will we hit them? I don't know, but, but we certainly, the, 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 the end point of our system collapsing is in, in sight. Um, and the mortality won't be just from COVID at that point. Then we'll get into additional mortality from people not being able to be treated for their heart attacks, their car crashes, their falls. So, um, you know, we, we kind of kicked around like, well, what can we do? Well, just like when you're trying to put out a fire with a fire extinguisher, you direct the, the stream at the base of the flames. You direct your efforts at the source. And the source of this right now, what's driving this whole thing is community transmission. And we do know now, unlike two years ago or you know, even a year ago, we know that the vaccinations work, we know that masks work, we know that distancing works. So whatever policy changes you guys can make, addressing those three variables in our community on as wide a basis as possible, that will help slow this down and stop the spread or at least decelerate the spread so that we can get to the peak sooner rather than later. And that's all I got. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Wack. Um, questions, comments for either Sue or Dr. Wack or the good group? Oh, Ms. Doyle, thanks for your presentation. Also, Dr. Wack, Wack, I'm a big admirer of you and I like how you put it in basic layman terms. I was wondering, is there any analysis of what has taken place in South Africa, which I was believe was the first nation to go through this Omicron variant, that we can overlay what we're going through to see any potential projection of where we might be going through the same situation. Is there any data from that infection in that nation that would help us? Uh, there is data. It's very preliminary data. Um, it's, it, it may be hard to generalize from their experience because they have very different uh, mm -hmm. demographics and the, the Understandable. opposition of their outbreak was, was different than ours. Um, so, and, but now in England, they're going through the same thing and some of the same patterns are emerging, emerging in England that suggest that on, in general, Omicron may be less severe than, than, uh, than the Delta and the prior variants. But our hospitalization data show today that regardless of what happens going forward today, we already have a crisis, so it doesn't, it really doesn't matter how much less severe Omicron is because the scope of this outbreak and the, the rapidity with which it's accelerating has already overwhelmed our system. So even if Omicron ends up being 50% less severe, it doesn't matter. We have so many more cases and they're arriving so quickly that our system can't handle it. So in, in a way it's almost irrelevant what 
whether Omicron is more or less severe or what their experience is, because we, we're having an experience right now where the system is, is completely overwhelmed. And Omicron is the dominant variant in our state right now. So this is totally an Omicron thing. We can't say, oh, well, maybe it's still Delta and, and when, when we get more Omicron, we'll be better off. No, this is Omicron today. That, that, the, the state of Maryland epidemiology lab basically said last week that Omicron is, that's what we have right now is Omicron. So, so whether it's more or less severe, it doesn't really matter because we know today that we're getting hammered. But would it give us a potential projection of hope of when we could start seeing some relief that won't be continuous, the bell curve, so to speak? Like how, yeah. how much time do you think we'd be put under all this stress? A month, two months? That's a great question. I can tell you that you can't even start talking about when it might end until you see that hospitalization curve start to bend. It's still, I don't know if you guys can see me, but it's Sloping still doing up. this. You know, it's, it's getting close to being straight up. And so until it starts to do this, then you can start saying, well, okay, if it keeps bending like that, then maybe, you know, a week from now, two weeks from now, it'll plateau, and then maybe another four or six weeks, it'll start to drop, and then you can start to project, like, okay, then, you know, in such and such a time, we may get some relief. But as long as it's doing this, who knows? Because we don't know where it's gonna top out. Well, that's why I was hoping maybe it, from other nations' experiences, it gives us some indication or potential hope. Yeah, I wish I could give that to you right now. I mean, well, are, uh, you know, just to, to follow up on that, are there other, not necessarily nations, but other communities, other states, other areas that we are starting to see relief uh, uh, that we can kind of well, have a comparison analysis to or no? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so unfortunately right now is I think um, Mr. Robinson and Mr. Hoover may have said this earlier. Uh, we are, we're one of the leading areas yeah. in the country, unfortunately. And so we are, we are the, the, the walking point on this. And um, so it's hard to know. So in other words, people are gonna be looking at us being in the top 10 right. when it turns to say, okay, yep. this is the expectations. Okay. That's right. um, Gary, yeah, you, you want to say? I'm not aware of any state. I completely agree with everything my colleagues have stated. I'm not aware of any states that have plateaued yet, to Dr. Wack's point. Right. Okay. Um, unless anything more direct to these two, what I'd like to do is open it. You've been very patient. I appreciate that um, for open comment, and then we can have our discussion from there and okay. move forward. Um, First, Chris, do we have anybody uh, as a caller? I have no caller, sir. Okay. Um, Roberta, why don't you uh, take over and just let you know when you come up, just share your uh, <clears throat> your name, um, where you're coming from. You'll have, you know, three minutes, uh, give or take, you know, um, and do not expect conversation. You know, it's, it's an opportunity for you to share your thoughts, and we'll take that into our discussion afterwards. So, okay. Uh, first card I have is Kate Martin. Thank you. Yeah, please. So my name is Kate Martin. I am a self-employed small business owner. I have five kids, two in public schools, three not in public schools. Um, I just found out about this meeting last night, and I was a bit concerned looking at the surrounding counties, how they're implementing mask mandates, vaccine mandates, et cetera, um, <clears throat> and restrictions on you know, businesses, the amount of people that can come into businesses. And uh, my concern is one of the things that we really haven't focused on is the silent pandemic of the um, mental health crisis that our kids are going through and parents are going through. Uh, my concern is that I know that we haven't followed Play follow the leader with the other counties as we had talked about in the very beginning, um, but I don't wanna see our county fo play follow the leader. I want us to continue being a leader in the state. Um, I don't think that we need to shut down businesses. I don't think we need to shut down schools and do the virtual learning. It was an, an absolute nightmare. Um, and I just believe that, you know, the statistics that we're looking at, I think we're, we're looking at a very small 
very small numbers and we're, we're focusing on the wrong things. Um, meaning you know, the positivity rate, the capacity rate. We know s hospitals and medical facilities are short staffed, which means the capacity rate, yes, although it's over capacity, if you had the more of the human resources that I believe his name was Michael had mentioned, um, we wouldn't be operating at the over capacity. Um, again, I just ask that you commissioners really take into consideration the silent pandemic that we are facing. I'm concerned about the country's future. I think this Omicron variant is not as catastrophic as the ones that were that we've had initially. Um, and I just hope that you seriously consider keeping the county open, not implementing the mask and vaccine mandates and keeping the businesses open. Um, and I thank you for your time today. No, absolutely. And you brought up thank some you. Uh, good points and I think we're gonna have those part of our discussion because good, good questions to be asked. Thanks. Next is Brian Thompson. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you. Um, I'm Brian Thompson. I'm the chair of the Concerned Parents of Carroll County Group. Um, I've, I'm an 11 year resident. I've got four kids in the school system. And like my colleague Kate mentioned, we kind of share some of the same concerns around the silent pandemic that's facing our children. Um, but, but first, you know, I want to say, just after listening to everyone talk about the situation, I really want to thank our hospital staff, our, our care units, our emergency care units. I mean, it, they're, they're our heroes right now. They're really doing an amazing job. Um, and without them, you know, I, I don't know where we'd be. So I really want to thank them. Um, I want to thank you guys too for your leadership because, you know, they say the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And I think what we've seen is that you know, we, I think the spread gonna, is going to happen regardless, right? We're seeing that now, especially with Omicron. Um, we've seen neighboring counties institute mask mandates, and we're still seeing the spread. So what I ask is that we look at the data around masking particularly it, before making any type of decisions around that. Uh, I, you know, I'm double vaccinated. I had COVID a couple weeks ago. It amounted to a man cold. You know, it, it was really not that bad. Um, so I would also advocate for vaccines as well to the public, not mandating them, mm -hmm. but making sure people are informed and given all the right information so that they can make informed decisions. Um, I also, uh, you know, I think a lot of the focus of the conversations in the meeting today are the right focuses, which is how do we get our hospitals the help they need? Mm -hmm. How do we scale up capacity so we can assist with the surge of patients that we have? Um, I do think you guys have some really good questions around you know, what are other communities, other nations facing at the moment? Because I, there is data out there that needs to be looked at. You know, you look at the UK, for example, they're facing the same thing. So I, I, think, I think we can get some information around projecting how long we're gonna be in this and what type of resources we're gonna need. But again, I think um, beyond that, I think you guys, again, me make us proud and you're doing an excellent job for us. So thank you very much for that. Okay, Brian, thanks. Yeah. And again, you, uh, like the other, taught us some good questions I know we're going to be talking about. Thank you. Shannon Kinkhorst. I pretty much agree with Kate and Brian. I, I think that it was very informative to hear what everything, everything everybody had to say today. It was um, a, a little bit eye-opening, but at the same time, I had a little concerns that um, it doesn't seem that we are as prepared in our medical response as maybe we should have been. I mean, Feel like there's a lot of meetings and talking going on now about what to do but uh, maybe in october that was the time to really have a plan that you could just flip a switch right away i don't know maybe maybe there was but it, it doesn't sound like we're ready to deal with a surge when when you know I, I saw it coming in october i ordered my at home rapid tests and tried to get my household in order because i remember what we went through last year so would have liked to see <clears throat> a little more preparation perhaps but Hopefully we can take care of it on the back end. Um, it concerns me a little bit um, to hear that it's just so much focus on vaccinated, vaccinated and unvaccinated when it clearly the problem is the elderly and those with underlying conditions. And I just wish there was some way we could get to those people before they even get to the hospital. I mean, if our healthcare, if our doctors, our local doctors can somehow identify these high risk patients, isn't there something we can do before they get, you know, if there's a surge unit we can open before they even get to the point or, you know, I just feel like we have to do better. There's got to be something better to do. 
Um, this is just me as a normal person who's been listening to every podcast you can imagine for the last two years. Um, but I think that um, not even as a last resort, it should be completely off the table that we implement any kind of mandates or restrictions on anybody in the public. Uh, no business closures, no capacity restrictions, certainly nothing that touches our children. Our children do not have any risk from this disease, and even their parents don't have much of a risk from this disease. So we have to let the bulk of the society continue to operate in a normal fashion. You have got to get to these elderly people and these the people who are, have diabetes and are obese. You have got to get to them and beg them to get the vaccine. If you know, target those people. Target the people who are clogging up the hospitals. Find a way to do it. I don't know how to tell you to do it, but find a way to do it because the message of vaccinate everybody isn't necessarily helping the hospitals. You know, if we're vaccinating the seven-year-olds, it's not keeping anybody out of the hospital. So. We need more targeted uh, focus. Um, just be smart about it. Let's just keep people from getting to the hospital. That's the number one focus. Cases don't matter at this point. It's never going away. Our hospitals are probably going to have to deal with this on a long-term basis. They may need 10 extra beds forever now. So um, I know you're doing your best. Just think about it outside the box from what the CDC is telling you. <laughs> OK, thanks, Shani. Jim Miller. Uh, thank you, commissioners. And um, they obviously said a lot of, um, I think, some of the talking points. But I just want to point out, I think my biggest concern is, you know, we've done really well in Carroll County. One thing you nobody mentions is we're actually the third highest vaccinated county in the state. 75% of our eligible um, population is vaccinated. Um, I think we should celebrate that. You know, I think that's something as a county we should celebrate. We actually stand with us on that. You know, we hear a lot of everyone saying this is the pandemic, the unvaccinated. We're doing pretty darn good in Carroll County. Um, one thing that, that was mentioned that I think is a big deal is, you know, you look at, at um, our children and the, and the pandemic of mental health crisis. Um, high schoolers are facing 50% increase in suicide rates and depression. You know, our elementary school kids, have three elementary school kids, they have not had a, a, my kindergartner doesn't even know what school is without a mask and not seeing friends' faces. My fifth grader has three straight years now. You know, her whole elementary school has been the pandemic. You know, we got to figure out how to target those who need protective and allow our kids and our younger our younger population somehow return to normalcy. Um, I will say that you know I'm a little concerned that our, our experts don't really understand the the current wave which Governor Hogan spoke about and his and his his um, um, you know health deputy spoke about. It's being driven by Delta right now. The hospitalizations are being driven by Delta right now. And he actually mentioned that yesterday in a tweet that we're still seeing Delta driving hospitalizations. Omicron cases, which the CDC said was 75 percent of our cases, they revised that down to 22 percent last week. Okay, we're just starting to see the, the wave of Omicron cases, but Delta is driving the hospitalizations, which makes sense, which is why you're seeing the severity. So the hope is as these cases rise, the severity actually comes down, as you point out, uh, Commissioner, about South Africa and the UK. And actually New York City is seeing that as well. They're seeing a huge spike in cases. And they're seeing one-tenth of the hospitalization rate that they saw in the initial Delta uh, wave. You know, so I think there is some positive to come out of this that maybe we should focus on. but. I ask that we just, you know, keep in mind that our, our teenagers, our children, they're struggling right now. They really are. And the last thing we really want to do is put any restrictions on them. Please, you know, I've, I've advocated for sports. You guys know that. Youth sports is big. You know, we can't take that away from kids right now. You can't take high school, high school sports away from our high schoolers, you know. Um, you've got to look at things to target the community that needs it. Booster shots. I'm double vaccinated like everybody else here, okay. They work. Let the public know they work. The last 25 percent, get to them, okay. But let's try to focus on targeted measures. Um, and I will say this, you know, vaccines aren't going to end this. You know, there's a really good article published about professional sports. Those of you who watch sports, 98% of the NFL is vaccinated. 100% of the NHL is vaccinated. 100% of the NHL is vaccinated. 95% of the NBA. They're having outbreaks. It's going gonna, it's gonna to occur. It's going to occur. We have to have that honest conversation, right? They're going to occur. Last thing is, um, you heard um, them talk about they're using N95 and KN95s in their own health buildings. They're not using cloth masks anymore, right? They know now, and Dr. Wen, who's on CNN, Baltimore Zone, has said they're facial decorations. So how about we take them off our children? All right, let's focus on those who need the KN95s, the N95s, give them out, let them protect themselves. But let's focus on those who need it. Okay, thanks, Jim, again. Appreciate all your comments, um, and they're gonna be discussed. 
I would expect uh, from us along with, uh, appreciate uh, Garrett and the health department uh, staying on because a lot of the uh, questions, uh, Chris, can you take down the uh, clock, please? Um, that was on you, the three minutes. Yeah, and a lot of the questions were uh, directed where I think uh, Garrett and the health department can also um, highlight some of the responses. Um, now it's uh, open discussion um, for us. So. Well, if I may, um, I, you know, I, I know uh, what one lady was saying here about the, uh, you know, asking people to get vaccinated. I had a neighbor pleaded with him, get vaccinated. Two, uh, it's been two weeks ago he died. Got COVID two weeks, he was done. And he wasn't gonna, he didn't believe it was real. No, not gonna do it. So, you know, you try, that happens, and people are responsible for themselves. We're not responsible for everybody. However, as leaders in the community, we are responsible for 300,000 acres here in Carroll County and 168,000 people become our responsibility to uh, direct some things. First of all, we gotta get rid of all political ideologies out here. We do not wanna get into politics on anything. We are responsible for our boundaries and the people in it. What can we do in there? First of all, we have some unvaccinated. That's their responsibility at this point. We can ask them, we can go do whatever we can, but this becomes somewhat their right or their uh, ability to do things. We can express everything to them, um, but you know that becomes sort of their responsibility at that one. We do have strange systems. We, the hospital, the police seem to be doing very well, but I'm sure it's a strain to keep up of what you're doing here. Uh, the health department is strained. What do we do? Then first of all, I think we have to come up, how can we help those institutions get uh, through this, at least for the next, I'd say 30 days, and I'm looking 30 days down the line. I don't think we can look any further than that. Um, I think Dr. Wack made a good point there, you know, as long as things are going up, we can't go too far in the future, but we do have to start to deal with what we have. Now, I know some of our, uh, uh, Gerstel, uh, McDaniel Community College, I think, has delayed uh, for a week here, going virtual for the week, uh, I believe, for the present time. Uh, so they're, they're doing, they got a little bit proactive on things. Uh, the school system, they will have to make their own decision. They are elected officials. That's up to their uh, Board of Education to make those decisions. I, d I think they know how we feel about it. Uh, we, we're in communication with them also all the time, but that's their decision, how they're gonna handle uh, the school board. The other thing is we do have the flu and colds. This is the season when that happens. And for young kids, they are spreaders of this. I mean, you put 30 kids into a room and they now, they've been out everywhere across the country and everything. We bring them back into a closed environment. We know that's gonna spread out to the community and they're gonna take everything home with them, whether it's a cold. And this happens every year in the school system. You look at the first of October, the absentee rate goes up due to colds. First of uh, the middle of January, first of February, absentee rate goes up. It's because they all the things they've brought back with them from other areas and just exposure and going out. But, um, you know, how long can we support, or can the hospital support right. this? How long can these things happen? We have to look at. Um, and as I think some people said, businesses, I think, know what they need, each business here. And we do not want to mandate things to a business. Uh, a business that deals with uh, the elderly may require masks. A business that deals with uh, teenagers may look at it differently than what uh, the other businesses do, but I do not want to get into the uh, area where we have to deal with the business. Uh, we're going to have to mitigate this the best we can, I think, for the next 30 days and come up with some things that we can be responsible for. We're responsible for county buildings. We're responsible for our county uh, work staff here. So I think we need to look at that. I think we need to continue uh, selling the idea of vaccinations. Uh, people won't get them, but we still have to continue to educate and get people out there uh, as much as possible on this. So, you know, you've got to look at the whole picture. Uh, we have to, I think, mitigate the areas where we're stressed the most, and I think the hospital needs a lot of help uh, at the present time. But here again, 
Where do you get staff? Where do you get the people right. to do that? That's the issue, and they're having the same issues. Where do you get people to work in businesses now? Uh, you know, a lot of people aren't. Where are we going to get EMTs? Uh, that's very hard to find. And uh, keep in mind, we're not going to keep up uh, if this continues the way it is. Unless everybody comes together, people are going to die. And we're not going to stop that. Uh, we're gonna, it's, it's a reality. And we're going to try to mitigate what we can, but it's not going to uh, be what I think we want it to be, with just a shut a switch off and make it end. It ain't going to happen. We'll have to design plans for years to deal with this. Now, Kate, I appreciate you saying you learned about this uh, last night. This was only um, designed to uh, occur, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, um, because of the conversations that we've been having with um, the hospital, uh, our health department and others, and the strain that they are having. Um, so in order to get all the information, for us to come together, we do it in an open session, and that's why. Um, and uh, I appreciate the gist of what the four of you said, which is also a lot of what others said. I may not agree with all of the information and facts, but I definitely understand the sentiment and the gist of it. And uh, there was no intent in my mind that a mandate, and I shared this with you earlier, was going to take place, especially to the public. Um, I don't think we're in a position to do that. We're absolutely not in a position uh, to do that with our education system. I mean, like uh, Commissioner Weaver, you shared, that's their job. We can say here are the resources and here's what's going on, but it is not our role uh, to put that in place, nor is it our role to put a mandate in place for Carroll County as a whole. I do agree we should lead by example. and. Uh, you know, we can do that within our own government. And I, I appreciate all of you talking about vaccines, how you promote it. Um, I don't want to mandate any of it. I never wanted to. I don't think any of us ever wanted to. So whoever says they, you know, again, are spewing conspiracies on, unfortunately, this social media is, is silly. Nobody up here wants to mandate any of it. Now, I do want to say, if you're not vaccinated, uh, the best thing you can do is to have mitigating situation by wearing a mask or something when you're coming into a crowded area. Um, being vaccinated, like, uh, you know, uh, Brian, you said, it was like a man cold. Because you're vaccinated, the symptoms are much less. That's exactly what we want to happen. Um, so how do we minimize the impact in the hospital of COVID-19 patients so others can get to the hospital that need the care they need as opposed to being rerouted other places. That's what this is uh, intended to do, at least I think. Um, so, uh, but I do, I, I appreciate, you know, the, the gist, especially when you're talking about um, vaccines. And, and the, the last thing is um, mental health. I absolutely agree. Uh, one, we've got to silence the stigma of mental health and continue to highlight if somebody is in need that they need to get the care necessary. Um, I've highlighted it with myself, uh, you know, personally <coughs> and professionally, and um, it's important. And whether it's 30 years in uniform that causes that or masks or something, uh, we've got to identify it. And um, uh, so that doesn't come lightly. Uh, on me um, when, when you're referencing it. Um, and we, and we got to do something about it and maybe put more resources towards it. I don't know, but again, you have to look at that. But Dennis? I was going to say, I have to agree with what's been said so far. We did not come here today with the intent of, number one, telling the school system what to do. They have a board of education. They're a separately elected body. They don't answer to us. They have to work with the health department and decide what, how they're going to end up. And that's their job to do that in conjunction with the health department. We did not come here today to tell businesses in Carroll County what to do. I have no intention of shutting any businesses down. And like Commissioner Weaver said, if your business deals with mostly elderly people or people that are at risk, maybe you want to put some controls in for your business, and that would be the wise and prudent thing to do. If you have a business that, that, that doesn't deal with the people that are might be more susceptible to getting the COVID, then 
you might want to do different things, but that's up to each the individual business to do that. We're not here to tell them what to do. However, I, I, I do think we need to lead by example. We need to do for our county office buildings and our county employees what we think is the right thing to do. And that's basically what, what we came here to do today is to try to lead by example and see what we're gonna do. There's someone mentioned getting the right information out. That is so critically important, but when all this other stuff comes around, it's so hard to know what the right information is. I have an acquaintance of mine that passed away a couple weeks ago. This person was in the late 30s. He had high blood pressure. He, had, um, he was overweight. He wasn't vaccinated. Ask him why you didn't get vaccinated. He was told, and he read, that if he got the vaccine, he would get cancer. Whoever told him that, or wrote that down, or, or put that out on social media, in my opinion, they're responsible for that person's death. That's why he didn't get vaccinated. You can't get the wrong information out there and people believe it, but they do believe it. And that's causing a problem. We've done the best we can, I think, to get the right information out here between it from ourselves here. I just, it's just so frustrating when something like that happens because right information is not out there. Um, and I, I was actually watching a comedian the other night, and although it's not a funny matter, but one thing he brought up, he says, how many people here think this, the COVID is very serious? And not too many people applauded his put it to me. He goes, yeah, you know, most people that aren't affected by it don't think it's very serious. But maybe ask some of the families of people that have died or sent weeks or something on ventilators, how serious they think the infection is. It's a whole different perspective. Depends on where you're coming from. This is serious. People are dying from it. We have to do something. And I think it's our responsibility as leaders here to do something to mitigate this uh, COVID, the spreading of this as much as we can for the people that we're in charge of, for the county office buildings, for the other county buildings, for those things, not the school system, not the businesses. I, am, I firmly believe that everyone should be vaccinated and get the booster. I've, I've vaccinated, get the boost. I've already had the booster. My family members have. I forced them, no, I didn't, but they all have. <laughs> but I think that has to be done. But I'm not going to tell you, you have to do that. That's not my responsibility. Everyone has to look at that on their own. However, I do believe that if you're not vaccinated and you don't have the booster, perhaps you should not go into uh, indoor gatherings. You shouldn't go out to large public meetings and stuff like that where you can possibly get it and spread it. I think that's the responsibility. If you don't want to get vaccinated, okay, but then you have to take some steps on your own not to spread it to other people around. That's, that's my opinion of what I'll say so far. I have other things written down here, but we'll go into that much sure yeah, later. Commissioner Wentz. Um, okay, thanks, Ed. A uh, couple things that a few of you have hit on <clears throat> with the social media thing. Of course, you all heard me say it before about social media, but um, it's disconcerting to me to have one of our colleagues um, get on social media and um, perpetuate the uh, ridiculousness uh, when it comes to our hospital. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, I don't look at that, but it was shared uh, with us on an email. And, um, you know, to blame the hospital um, is just absurdity to me. Um, the hospital is full of heroes. Our, our first responder community is full of heroes. I I'm just done. I'm so done with that ridiculous stuff that goes on. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I will say that, and you all know who I'm talking about, and I'll leave it go at, at that, because um, that just adds to the challenges that all of us are dealing with as we move forward here. And um, it's incredibly disrespectful to the, to the community uh, of, of workers at, the, at that uh, facility and everywhere else. Uh, it makes me incredibly sad. Uh, I will say that uh, I am not here to mandate either. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know that we have the legislative authority even to do that if we could. Um, and uh, for me, uh, and I will share this, uh, I just lost a classmate of mine uh, this past week uh, who I went to school with. 
uh, who did not believe in the vaccines. Um, the gentleman's no longer with us. Uh, this continues to go on and on. So for me, it's about personal responsibility. And uh, that says it all. <coughs> uh, I truly believe that uh, at this point, you, you've got to know how serious this is. And you've got to, to, to get away from this, this craziness of, of doing this, of, of commenting on everything all the time and, and pulling people down into a huge rabbit hole. Uh, I believe it's time for us to say to everyone, please, uh, we, we implore you to take personal responsibility. If you feel ill, Ill stay home. Uh, if, 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 you, uh, if you are not comfortable uh, going into a public place, don't go. To those that are having functions, does anybody remember common sense? I, I'm not sure that that's a, a thing anymore either, uh, but that's how I've done this job for the last seven years, utilizing common sense. So to me, if you have a gathering of people, uh, it's just common sense to me and, and respect for fellow man to, to wear a mask if you choose to. In, in that uh, in, in those in those venues if you feel like you can't have those and and Mike Robinson uh, alluded to this before maybe it's time for folks during this critical period that we're in for however long it's going to be in to postpone some of these uh, these gatherings to to not continue to uh, to have this stuff spread but um, I, I I was not here today to do any mandates. Uh, I don't know where that rumor came from. Uh, well, I do know where the rumor came from. Uh, it gets back to what I said when I first started this conversation. The absurdity of those on social media and other platforms uh, that, that, um, that have taken this to an, a, a whole level of disrespect, and uh, I include one of my colleagues in that. Uh, I also believe um, that it, it, it is incredibly uh, important that we watch out for one another and uh, respect those that either want to wear a mask or don't, um, respect those uh, and not, not, not stoop yourself into that rabbit hole to, to make uh, you know, these kind of comments. So um, you know, I'm comfortable making sure that we continue uh, to, to put out the importance of this kind of a platform, the transparency of knowing what everybody's doing, and uh, making sure that we advise people that it's, it's critically important to utilize best practices and to bring back that common sense. That's gonna get us through this. Okay, thanks. Um, Commissioner Boucher, did you want to go? Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank my colleagues for having this forum and the leadership of Commissioner Rothstein to bring it forward and all the players that have come together in this. And I will state that I emphatically agree 100% with Commissioner Wentz that we as individuals need to take responsibility for our own health. That is critical. And I'm heartwarmed to see that my colleagues don't want to enforce any mandates. And one of the reasons that is a concern of our citizens is not me as indirectly insinuated by my colleague, but it's a direct result of other jurisdictions surrounding us putting those mandates in place and turning to us for some sort of leadership. So that pressure of surrounding jurisdictions around Carroll County, which is viewed as an island in Maryland, is a legitimate concern for our conservative citizens out there. I also want to emphasize that getting this alleged vaccine, which truly is not a vaccine in its true sense, does not protect you from contracting and spreading the disease. If anything, I think it's scientifically determined that you can be an asymptomatic spreader of the disease just as if you're not vaccinated. And I will thoroughly encourage those people who have, who are obese or suffer some from some other comorbidity, 
just as some of our citizens here have emphasized, they are the people who the most of our resources need to be focused in on to help. We need to focus our resources in on helping the people that are most vulnerable and dying. Thank you very much. Okay, you, be, uh, wait, be, be, before you jump in, and I know, uh, Dr. Wack, you want to jump in, and uh, right. Garrett, yeah, I think I, you also I, have I, some I, comments. I, Just yeah. bear with me a second. Um, a comment about states of emergency, Baltimore County, Howard County, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Baltimore City, and Anne Arundel County should be deciding uh, next week. Frederick County is looking at a state of emergency themselves. What I find very interesting is, unfortunately, and Commissioner Wance brought it up, or somebody brought it up, Commissioner Weaver maybe, this is not politics. This is about taking care of a community. This is not about South Africa. It's not about England. It's about Carroll County. And unfortunately, the newspapers, the first thing they say is uh, county executive so-and-so, Democrat, is calling a state of emergency. And that's a problem where we are very well divided, and that causes a lot of angst. This is not about politics. It's about how do we take care of Carroll County. And I'm, I'm really fed up with this. You know, this is a Democrat view, this is a Republican view, and we're an island, we're not. This is about a community. Um, and it's not about constituents. And we gotta do something. That's why we're having this meeting uh, to openly talk to uh, Garrett, to the hospital, to Dr. Wack and the team on what resources they need to mitigate the challenges that lie in front of us. So with that, um, and I apologize, I'm gonna hold you off one second, Dr. Wack. Chris, do we have a caller? Um, yes, sir. Okay, why don't we give that caller the opportunity no. uh, and I, then I wanna hand it off. I, I know, this way it tempers you down. <laughs> Okay, we're going to go through with this caller? Yes, go with, with the caller. Caller, you've been unmuted. Please identify yourself. You'll have three okay. minutes. Okay, my name is Francine Hahn. I live in Westminster. I've been a Carroll County resident for about five years. Um, I just have a concern when you talk about um, caring for and being concerned about the mental health of Carroll County residents. It doesn't seem as though that those of us who are vaccinated, who are boosted, who wear masks, um, are really being thought about in this equation. Uh, you know, it is a bit terrifying to go out in a county where almost no one is masked and where all these pleas, which I appreciate for people to actually get vaccinated, are falling on deaf ears. And that's absolutely apparent with what's happening here in this county. Um, and so I don't see why a mask mandate in the county is burdensome. Um, it would just be helpful. I mean, I'll start doing my shopping in Baltimore County. I'll take my tax dollars to Baltimore County where I can feel more protected, more cared for. Um, I, do, I do go to a couple of small businesses here in Carroll County where they do require masks because it just feels safer. Um, and uh, as for schools, I know you can't do anything about that, and I don't, I don't want the schools to shut down. I would just like for there to be more a focus on how can we encourage the vaccination rates to go up in each of the individual schools so there can be an off-ramp for the mask mandate so that we can have a safer environment <coughs> for our children. Um, and I don't think that that's been talked about enough. It's not, it's not a mask mandate or nothing. There are other options out there to make our community safer. And I think that needs to be the focus instead of this, this fight with the state um, over a mask mandate uh, when the state is providing an off-ramp possibility. Um, and so I just, I, just want, I just want you, the commissioners, to think about those of us who you know, we, who have lost loved ones, who are scarred, who, um, who are dealing with our own mental health issues and are trying our best to do all that we can to protect the loved ones that we still have. Um, and it's a struggle. <laughs> it's a real struggle. And, um, and yet we're surrounded by people who honestly don't seem to care about the community as a whole 
and and aren't being very helpful in doing that. And that's frustrating and it makes it harder from a mental health standpoint. And so I was hoping that I would feel more support um, from this meeting, but um, I don't, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Tracy. <coughs> um, Commissioner Frazier, did you wanna go? You want to say let Dr. Wack go first. Okay, uh, Dr. Wack. Please, as you, as you speak, Dr. Wack and Garrett, would you guys please uh, add one thing? What do you need from us? And what do you want from us? What do you need from us? I guess are the right. two things I asked you to respond to somewhere. Okay, uh, so to your point, uh, Commissioner Weaver, I'll refer to uh, Mrs. Doyle on, on the specific ask. Um, I just want to, uh, Commissioner Bouchette, I know you and I don't agree on vaccines generally or the COVID vaccine specifically, and so I'm not trying to persuade you. Um, and and I, again, I put my offer on the table to have this discussion offline. But since this is a public meeting and we are creating a public record, I want to make sure that the public knows that the, the COVID vaccine is a vaccine. It's not a so-called vaccine. It does prevent serious illness it does decrease transmission and it is safe. Those are very uh, well-established, well-supported, data-driven um, facts that um, need to be consistently repeated over and over in public settings because there is so much disinformation out there on social media. And we certainly can't leave statements like that unchallenged in a public meeting. That's all, thank you. For clarification, will you state that vaccinated people do spread the disease? Yeah, I, 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 they also can have breakthrough infections that have uh, transmission occurred, but it is less. They right. are sick well, for I'm, I'm, time, Thank you for clarifying that. But, on, but, but that's not so the point. Right. But on the one, one hand, you have called for, for, I'm sorry, Dr. Wack, go ahead. People. I'm sorry, I cut you off, Dr. Wack, I'm sorry. But on the one hand, sure. you and other people have called, let's get the right information out there, it's the right information out there, and then you make a statement like that about the vaccine, which is totally incorrect. The, he just reiterated no, it. He, that's not what you said. He didn't say anything about the vaccine and people having va getting the vaccine, uh, they couldn't get the, the coronavirus. He didn't say that. But you said it's a so-called vaccine, it's not a real vaccine. That's incorrect. Information like that should not go out from a public official at a public forum like this. It shouldn't. This you want to keep putting that stuff on social media? You're welcome then to Then why do that. are we up to the third booster? They're called for it's fourth booster. It's a vaccine. Booster. The vaccine is a vaccine. It's approved. It's a it's vaccine. A, because you don't like understand polio or smallpox. Because you don't yes. understand science. Doesn't There's a big mean difference put, scientifically no. between the no, vaccine that cures polio. There's no virus that is not there anymore, and that's smallpox. Well, vaccines are vaccines. How do we get rid of them? because uh, it was oh a vaccine. We, These vaccines no, no. will not eradicate this virus. That's what I'm getting at. Oh this God. virus will no, be man. with us for the rest right. of your life, just like the Spanish okay. influenza. And that's not what you said. You yeah. said this is a so-called vaccine, it's not a real vaccine. It's a vaccine. There's a because difference it's not between, going to eradicate this. That's not what you said, though. Then, then be more specific on what you're saying the so the CDC, right information, the so the right information gets out there. You yes, put out the wrong information. All right, we'll, we'll quote the CDC as redefining a vaccine from its previous definition to its new definition. Okay. And we and control are two different things. Yeah. Why don't we talk about what, what steps okay. we can take here? Let's move on. Yeah. This that's, is not going to go anywhere. Ed, that's what I was going to suggest because we can sit here and, and debate all we want. I know, but, 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 but Steve, but I, I listen, get you, but the fact is. Listen, clearly over the last three years, whatever uh, is said about social media and perpetuating fear by quoting uh, ridiculousness doesn't resonate with our colleagues. But we have a responsibility so, up here on the well, dais. That, but it doesn't resonate and everybody you know, knows that. So I think we should move on to uh, what steps we need yes. to take. Let's move on. Uh, I'm gonna be in, in, as far as you know, uh, the public or our building or whatever it is that that um, that you decided okay. to, I, to do here. I, I get you. And, and I, I do. Yeah. I, I I got it. And it's but I will say, we have a responsibility to do the best we can to ensure from the dais and our role that the facts are put out. 
It's not our facts and someone else's facts. It is the facts. Right. And that's why a vaccine is a vaccine. So, but right. you're, you're right. I think, um, Garrett, there was um, some comments that were made um, by some of our, uh, you know, uh, speakers that came out um, that, did you want to clarify? Um, I'm trying to find my notes because I took a handful of them. Uh, did you take notes, Garrett, on uh, some yeah, of the I'm, comments? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, Please. make some comments regarding around, uh, one in particular around the planning activities. How is it that hospitals couldn't anticipate these next waves? And quite honestly, each hospital across the state and across the country are required to submit surge plans uh, to their state health department. Carroll Hospital did the same thing. We did this very early on. And so what we couldn't anticipate is what is the impact that it creates to an overwhelmed staff? The average age of our nurses is 51, 52-ish. Keep me honest here, Sue. But many are making career decisions. I've had enough of healthcare. I've had enough of COVID. I'm retiring. That was one wave. Another that said, you know, if I'm going to do this as a career, I'm going to go to work for agency staff and I'm going to travel a little bit, do a 12 week assignment, make double or three times what I'm making now. Why do I want to do this? And so, could we anticipate that as part of our search plan? No. We're responding as aggressively and vigorously as we can to staff a hospital with the overwhelming volumes that are occurring. And this is a national crisis, this is not a Carroll County crisis ask any hospital in any jurisdiction they're struggling with the same scenarios so from a planning standpoint i think we had a very strong surge plan in place we could not anticipate where it's going to peak and we could not anticipate the devastating impact that it's had to the staff those are two failure points that i think we can learn from for the future um, in terms of my my ask in terms of support what you can't solve my staffing crisis, unfortunately. Every hospital is doing the same initiatives. We're reaching out to international nursing agencies. We're calling domestic agency staffing. We're encouraging many people to pursue health occupations for the future, but that doesn't solve the crisis that we have right now. There are five states, or five hospitals across the state right now that are operating under crisis standards of care. I'm not gonna name who they are. But de facto, I would say most of the hospitals are already meeting those trigger criteria. They just haven't officially announced it yet. And what does crisis standards of care mean? It means inadequate supplies, inadequate staffing, inadequate capacity to alter or modify the way in which we deliver care. None of us got into healthcare for that reason, but we are operating under critical standards. Every hospital, every part of this state. Um, my other um, comments around how can you support us, it would be great if we could have a unified message that get boosted, get vaccinated, it makes a difference. You won't get as severely ill as others. Does it impact the elderly, the obese, the unhealthy more than absolutely, but it's also affecting a younger population if you listen to my comments around age cohorts. 25% of the population between the age of 40 and 59, which I consider to be pretty young, are being affected by this. 10% of the population under age 40 are being affected by it. Okay, so I'm not a mathematician, but that's 35% of our population that aren't elderly or obese and they're being affected by this virus, okay? The, the other thing that I would suggest is continue to support the health department in its effort to set up testing sites. We are overwhelmed in the hospital. We don't need to be conducting outpatient testing. You know, go to the health department, use the sites that are out there. They're gonna continue to try and ramp up additional testing locations. Utilize those appropriate resources. Don't show up to the emergency department unless it's truly an emergency. That's my ask. No, Gary, I, I appreciate it. And you know, um, we, we are fortunate to have in-person, you know, uh, callers or speakers. And uh, you all said about the importance of getting vaccinated. You also said the importance of not mandating, which none of us believe in mandating either vaccines. 
getting a unified message, I'm trying to figure out how to get that unified message. Um, it becomes very difficult, and what I share with you is to help us reach out to whoever you are and whoever clicks and say, listen, I was here, you're vaccinated, the informs, you get a man call, whatever you want to say, but if you can find one more person to get vaccinated, that's a message that will help unify this community. This community is better than I think anyone else out there. Carroll County is no Carroll County, is better than anyone. But for some reason, we're still not able to get that, that message across to everyone that needs to get vaccinated. So just consider that at, at this point. Um, but uh, Garrett, I appreciate the, Another question, Garrett, that was brought up um, had to do with uh, Delta and Omicron in the hospital. I, you know, and I just don't know, is there any sense of that? Um, because you said there's 52 or 59 in the hospital. I mean, and yeah, I just don't know the difference. COVID positive. I honestly don't have the breakdown, uh, nor do I know if we have the capability right now to determine what percentage of that are Omicron versus Delta. I, I don't have that data at this point. Okay. Um, okay, what else? Uh, what else do we want? Did, did Dr. Wack have a comment on oh, that? You just yeah. Sorry, Dr. Wack? No, I was just going to say that that, you know, I was going to agree with uh, Garrett's uh, observation. That, that typing of the, of the variants that's done at the state labs, and um, that's what I was basing my uh, remarks about the dominance of the Omicron variant. That's coming from the state lab. I don't know where the other folks are getting their information, but that's, that's what they're reporting to us at the local health departments. Oh. On a positive note, is it potentially a chance that the Omicron variant being milder will push out the Delta and be less severe? You know, will the virus downgrade over time like the Spanish influenza did? Is that potentially happening or will happen? Um, so as I said before, the Omicron, at least from what the state lab is telling us, the Omicron variant has already pushed out Delta. Um, it may be that it's milder, uh, but that's not an inevitable thing. Uh, the mutations that create these variants don't go just in one direction. They can create variants that are more lethal. They can create variants that are less lethal. They can make variants that are more contagious. They can make variants that are less contagious. We don't know. There's no necessary direction for that. Um, so that's why it's, it's not prudent, especially since we're already in a crisis with our healthcare system to count on this being less serious somehow because we're already in a crisis. So it doesn't matter if, if this is really less serious or not. It's overwhelming our system today. So projecting things, hoping it's gonna get better, that's not a plan. Um, we have to deal with the crisis that's in our lap right now. Thank you. Okay, I think, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, uh, it was brought up that we could use some more testing sites. So I'm going to ask yeah. Sue Doyle, how can we help you with that? Where can we put more testing sites out? Uh, are we going to go back to the Ag Center? You're putting them at uh, Carroll Community College now, I understand. Can we do, and if, if we <laughs> made that space available to you, could you staff it? So those are our big issues. Um, we are at the Community College starting the 7th. And then after that, we'll be there Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays doing vaccines. We have secured the Ag Center for Tuesdays and Thursdays for testing. We can push through about 300 people in the period of time. We're working with um, Valerie Hawkins and the rest of the team to try to staff that. We have the testers and we have some other individuals, but we're going to need the manpower to control traffic. That's the biggest. We don't want anybody getting hurt. Um, we can do three lanes. We're pulling back our experts that were doing it before. Um, I don't want to spread, I mean, at the health department, we have to spread it out over eight hours because we can't have that many cars coming in. Um, we're gonna do appointment only for right now um, because we do need to be testing and be available for other community partners. And that's really important that we can keep our services going for the people that are running government and that, you know, public safety and um, those types of things. So our big ask is gonna be some manpower. We have reached mm -hmm. out to um, mm -hmm. 
the state at GOVAX to see if they'll help staff our um, vaccination clinics. And most of the roles that we're looking to fill are not roles that where we need medical professionals or anybody with expertise. These are roles that people can be easily trained for, you know, line management, observation afterwards, um, and, you know, management of the traffic out there at the Ag Center would be really helpful. Um, we have a couple of people already on board saying we'll be there, you know, if anybody out there wants to volunteer, go to Maryland Respond, sign up, um, tell them you want to come out and volunteer to help us. Um, but, you know, when we're rolling back services so that I can pull staff from their other jobs. But in the end, we still have to go out and inspect restaurants. We still have right. to secure mm -hmm. building permits and we still have to keep life going. So, you know, there's a limited amount of people that we can pull and keep those other services going and, okay. and really, you know, looking at those things. So, spoke with uh, Secretary uh, Schrader. We have a one o'clock call today, so I, I can tell you from there. I know that Commissioner yeah. Rothstein, I want to thank you. I know that you've reached out and asked for National Guard support. Okay. Um, we were on a health officer's call last night, and we were told, you know, that they're, they're trying to get some manpower to us to help support increased testing. Um, the fact that they're sitting, setting up five testing sites throughout the state doesn't help Carroll County. I want people going three counties away to get to a testing site. And when they set up those test sites, that's what happens when you go to the websites. It selects the closest testing site to you when you enroll. And that could be Howard County, it could be Frederick County, it could be Charles County, if that's the day they're doing the testing. So we wanna to try to expand those services here. Um, the Ag Center is open to other days. Um, if, as long as there's availability, they're gonna allow us to keep our setup there as long as there's not other activity. So that's really gonna help us that we don't have to set up and tear down. And is, is that's there, probably about it, but I'll keep everybody posted. Okay, is there one thing, another thing was mentioned was this, a surge facility. What can we do to help set up a surge facility or do we have the ability to do that county or this it has to come from the state or federal government because I know both things were mentioned, but it seems like something that should be done here. Can I, can I speak to that sure. uh, briefly? So. As part of our surge plan, we have a 10 bed medical hospital in our parking lot that means set up at the beginning of the pandemic. Now we've used it on occasion, but not as overflow for patients. We've run some testing out of there. We've tested employees. We can't staff that unit. It's not a physical bed issue in Carroll Hospital at this. That's not our present limitation. I have two nursing wings that I can't staff. Three north, that's 10 beds and three west that is 18 beds. So I have 28 available rooms. I can't staff it. So it's not about physical capacity that I'm struggling with. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank yeah, you. like uh, Sue said, good conversation with the state, um, getting them to understand the criticality. And uh, you know, the National Guard is being called um, from the governor. Uh, it is administrative, so it would support um, what Sue is describing so uh, let's just keep working towards that and I really do appreciate Valerie and the entire team working together right. um, you know where there, there's no distance in, uh, in the discussions we're having okay it, if I may very quickly Please. we've addressed vaccinations and testing the one element we haven't talked about is the treatment what is the treatments that are being utilized as saving people's lives because we seem to have reduced the fatality rate I believe looking at the chart relative to previous outbreaks. What type of treatment is available? I think that's one of the most important components of this conversation has been completely void. What is saving people's lives and what do you need in treatment? I can share what happened with the health officers call last night. I know that there's um, the fact that we had the security incident at the state, the data was not getting to the federal government, so there was a decrease in monoclonal antibodies that was coming to the state of Maryland. The governor did act on that immediately. Um, I think they reduced actually the supply by half. I do know the new um, medications that are coming out are all coming to the state. They gave, and I can, I can, I will have to go back and research this because I just listened to the presentation this morning before I came into work um, on how many um, doses were coming. I think we were under um, delivered last week, but we are going, that's gonna be made up for this week. 
Um, and then the projections were that we would be getting those things um, coming to us on a regular basis at the right rates. Um, I know they're working with hospitals on um, getting those medications there and getting them to centers that can administer them. Um, I know that we were working in Carroll County to get a site and that we were one of the only counties that did not have a site locally so that people were having to travel. So I can follow up on those. And the last thing I wanna um, end with for you all, just so that you know, is that we have been getting um, home test kits that we've been able to give out for free, the rabbits. Um, so they, I don't know what formula they use. We've been getting 850 every two weeks. There's two tests in a kit. The kits go together. So if we're handing them out to just test are going to somebody. Um, last week we were told we were gonna get double the volume starting this week, um, that didn't happen. I actually had to send staff to the airport to pick up the test kits because they were not delivered. Uh, sent three cars down, got them here so that we would have them here this week. We have now um, officially ordered pallets of these home test kits since August and we have never received any. They have been delayed. They have been hijacked from by the, the federal government for the program that they're instituting. Um, we were promised we were getting three pallets next Tuesday. I just got an email while I was sitting here with you all. We are not getting those pallets. So we are pretty much dependent on whatever home test rapid kits we're getting from the state. I cannot guarantee that. Um, I know that we have a, a supply set aside for next week that will go out to the library so that people don't have to come to this location and I know that we've had a supply set aside for um, 911 EMS and and some other partners that are key to keep the workforce going so uh, you know if somebody has a poll to get us some uh, Binet nail test kits that would be lovely uh, I, I don't know if uh, the sheriff wants to give me a call afterwards figure out what test kits he's using and where he's getting them maybe there's a resource we don't know about, but every place we've checked, we've not been able to secure that resource. Okay, we'll uh, we'll definitely follow up, and um, you know, a, a lot, I mean, it's where the priorities are, and uh, that's where the resources are going. Uh, that that was the conversation we we're having: is identifying ourselves as critical to then make it a priority. Um, okay. Any other comments? What uh, I'd like to do is, I believe um, that. Uh, Chris, you said there's one more call. This will be the end of our uh, calls, and then we will have our discussion, final discussion. Uh, Chris? Yes, sir. We have one more caller. Okay. Caller, you've been unmuted. Please identify yourself, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, this is Daniel Eli. I'm a president of <clears throat> Elders Park. Uh, I've been uh, in the Carroll County since uh, 1996. My wife has been in the county as well. Um, I currently tested positive for COVID. I was showing symptoms. Uh, I had COVID, uh, tested positive on Tuesday. I'm fully vaccinated. Um, my wife is unvaccinated and she tested positive for COVID as well. <clears throat> we both ran fevers. Uh, we're both pretty healthy. We're both under, well, I'm 40. Um, she's under 40. Um, but we're both uh, pretty much uh, back to normal now. What, almost 72 hours or 48 hours earlier. <clears throat> I just want to give some statistics uh, that, I, that I think is, is uh, you know, potentially uh, that, we can, that we can look at. Um, if we're talking about kids. Uh, um, the, uh, the current deaths uh, for COVID in Maryland for 19 and under are 12 deaths. So annually, about six deaths uh, for kids in Maryland. There's been uh, 18 kids murdered in Baltimore City this year. Um, I, you know, when we look at shutting down schools or going virtual, I think we got taken. I have three kids: one in elementary, one in middle school, and uh, one in uh, in um, preschool. And it and it takes them. It, it mentally, the mass, mentally, that they, they don't want to go to school. They want to be homeschooled. They want to get in a co-op. Uh, I, I really feel that we need to look at the healthy individuals and the healthy kids. And 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 it doesn't really matter about vaccination or unvaccination to me because 
I think more importantly, it's the mental health of the kids, and I'm, and I'm against the um, mask mandate, and I'm against going virtual to the schools. <clears throat> Sorry, can you hear? Yes, keep going. Thank you, hung up, Commissioner. Okay. Well, I, I'm gonna say something okay, after Okay, so that. Dan, yeah, turn, turn off the, uh, the timer and get us back on screen and now let's have our conversation and move forward. I'll just make a comment about that last caller. No amount of death, deaths are acceptable. Oh, 60 years okay? It's not okay. It's not okay. And that's what the, the, I, it seemed that, that he was trying to say. It, it's only six deaths a year for kids. That's six too many. Shouldn't be any. Stuff like that bothers me. So I just, I just had to say that, sorry. The, uh, the focus of this, again, was gathering information, uh, understanding the resources that are needed uh, to continue to support our community and keep it as healthy uh, moving forward and going into 2022. So I really, truly appreciate um, Sue and Dr. Wack and Garrett and uh, the Sheriff and Mike uh, all being a part of this discussion along with uh, the community and callers. Um, I think from our perspective, to the community is there's zero intent to push a mandate moving forward. Absolutely no authority or responsibility in having the schools do that because that's the Board of Education's uh, responsibility. And we do talk to the Board of Education, but you know that is not our role. Um, so that is their role in moving forward. Um, and like uh, Commissioner Wentz, you shared, I'm not sure we even have that legislative authority to mandate something to businesses. But regardless, I think it would not be in the best interest of Carroll County to move forward with that anyway. And I think we've all agreed to that. Um, so now the question that was uh, discussed or brought up by a couple was leading by example in the county. And what do we want to do in the county facilities? Um, so I'll open it to that, but I mean, Besides that, what else do we want to talk about? <laughs> I just want to say thank you. We heard from the leaders in the community <clears throat> dealing with the stuff, uh, head of the hospital, <clears throat> the health department, uh, doctors that know what's going on. We heard from the sheriff, heard from our EMTs. We know we should have a pulse on what's going on in the community. And I think at this point, I heard one thing, help with the testing sites. And that's what uh, the health department, which I think that's has to be a priority of ours to help them uh, with those testing. Number two, I'll go back now to where we are as commissioners, what do we want to, uh, where do we want to go with what we have control over uh, for our own employees or our own staff? And that's kind of, I think, going to be the uh, rest of the conversation here today. Okay. Well, if you want to, I mean, I'll start off what I think we should do for our own buildings. That if someone is not vaccinated, they should be they should wear a mask into the building. And it, it, be honest with you, if we could get the N95 mask, it would be ideal. I don't know if we can we get a hold them. of them. We, we have them, them. and those are the ones that should be distributed to the employees because they obviously are the best. I could have one myself, by the way. But anyway, I think we should do it. If you're not vaccinated, wear a mask in, in coming into work. And perhaps even if you're not vaccinated, if the job can be done remotely, and I'm not sure, and it all has to be looked at, maybe that's even a better solution because it, it, it would keep them out of the, the workforce and the potential of spreading anything would be zero. And using the honor system on whether people are vaccinated or not, because we are not being directive in show, saying, show us your vaccine card. Well, we're not asking for that right now, but let's, well, right now, let's, well, that, we're talking about right now, yeah, but so let's see how that works. But uh, I'm kind of torn on that one. But so well, bring it, I mean, I, I don't mean, know what I, others, I, I, know what I others think, think the only way to enforce it would be on the honor system. And uh, well, it, it's not the only way to enforce it, but it's well, it's the way we can afford. We do don't it. expect yeah. people to lie because people don't lie. <laughs> right. And uh, so if you're saying if you're not vaccinated, you wear a mask in right. government buildings. Um, Steve, did you have uh, thoughts, comments? Well, uh, the only thing with the masking thing is, I think clearly it's already been stated that um, the cloth masks are not effective. So if you, 
got enough masks to give out to our employees, then they should be getting the, the, the N for K95s. Um, or double masking, if you will. Uh, I think that needs to occur too. Um, Bob, you're chiming in. You want to? Yeah, I was just going to say um, more is better. So if, you, if for some reason there's a shortage of KN95s or N95s, a layering surgical masks with cloth masks is better than either alone. So you, it's about slowing airflow, creating barriers. So um, layering is an option as well if you have any sort of resource constraints. Okay, that, okay. thank you. That, that was my point. I mean, you know, we're all, we're all walking around. I mean, masks have become sort of a, a, a fashion statement now. You know, what kind of, what kind of uh, logos can you get put on masks now? We're far past that, so I want to be clear. If we're going to do this mask thing, we got to do it correctly. Yeah. Uh, and number two, I think it's really difficult to try to enforce. Uh, you mentioned working from home if you're not vaccinated. I, how in the world are you going to do that? I, I, I can't. I can't even imagine how that would work. Um, and you talk about alienating some of our workforce. Well, that to me is unacceptable. No, I, I didn't. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. But I didn't mean to mandate that. I meant it, it, it's up to the individual if it can be worked out. If they feel safer, they're not vaccinated, they don't want to wear a mask in here, then if it's going to be worked out, it could possibly work remotely. I wasn't suggesting okay. that we keep them from entering the building. <laughs> I, that's, I, I, if that might have come across wrong, that's not what I meant. I, I, yeah. we, we got Roberta biting her tongue. Uh, <laughs> Roberta, did you want to add to this? Um, so yeah, uh, we we have many staff members who are able to telework. Many who are not. Um, right. It's pretty hard to clean the water from you know your living room sure. um, or pave a road, unfortunately. Um, but we can certainly. That's the board's direction that if um, that if they uh, are unvaccinated and um, are able to work remotely successfully for the county, you know, if they're yes. They're, an employee who's you know capable of doing that then we could probably work that out and, and it sounds like we're sending I believe the right message I mean the sheriff and uh, fire and uh, health care they're all doing very much the same the state uh, is doing the same by wearing masks by leading by example saying these are at least the protective measures that we're moving forward we do not want to mandate and uh, we don't want to go above and beyond you know what the governor has said you know in the states of emergency we've already declared that um so okay uh and we have always agreed to follow the governor's mm -hmm. recommendations but uh, if until that changes i think we have to have our own uh, plan then it's a very good idea that you had here as far as uh, uh teleworking if if it works uh it yeah, it's, it's right. It's only for a few, but it might some people might be able to take advantage of it. So, uh, I, I think you know we go that way. Um, if you're not vaccinated, wear a mask. Very simple. Oh. And our our boards and commissions meetings, it, it, I'm just asking because I we mm -hmm. said that originally that if you couldn't be six foot apart in a meeting, that would be a virtual meeting. Yes. We're still holding up with that. And any I meeting. think that's important. Yeah, any yeah. Meeting. Well, I'm right. just pointing them out. Yeah, right. but it's true. any meeting. If you can't be six feet apart, then make it a virtual meeting. Right. right. If the I room mean, capacity, is, if the number of people exceeds the room capacity with right. the six foot right. distancing, then yes, it is. Yep. Virtual. And the intent is to keep this pexy glass up and yeah, oh continue yeah, keep, keep these measures, measures in place because so. even if we get done with the coronavirus, mm -hmm. what's what's next? So. Um, okay, uh, Steve, you're lit up. You want to say? Well, the other the other thing about that that, um, that our boards and commission meetings. Uh, we, we need to make sure we're enforcing that. The last planning and zoning meeting that we had, uh, that room had a lot of folks in it. I guarantee you it exceeded capacity down there. Um, so we need to pay attention to that. If we're gonna, if we're gonna do these things, we need to be able to enforce them. Right, uh, yeah. There were, there were attorneys, there were builders. I mean, there was a lot of folks in that room. Uh, clearly the message was getting mixed there. So right. that, they that's my point too. If we're gonna if we're gonna send the message, then let's send the message. Let's not be sending mixed messages. Either we're doing it that way, uh, and we have to keep people from being in the room or whatever. We're gonna have to do that. Correct. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's supposed to be virtual. So I'll, I'll check with 
Woodland on that. No, I, it, there, there, it, was, it was a specific you know, activity that was happening, and it was a highlighted area, and there was a lot of interest. And you know that- It was actually, it was actually about three or four specific- uh, Yeah, right. so I mean, there was, <laughs> so, which, but, but which I, I, mean, I agree with you. It. I, w I was thinking about making a no lawyer rule, but I didn't think that was why. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm getting Christmas cards from lawyers. Um, <laughs> that was a joke. We direct a monitor of that. And we, yeah, we tried that in the city of Westminster, Commissioner Fraser, and it didn't work. <laughs> okay. Um, so. And I, I do agree that, that the honor system is critically important here. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I truly believe that out of respect, uh, for your your fellow workforce, and we've got a fantastic workforce here, and we work together well. We always have. Uh, I truly believe if you're not vaccinated, you should be masked, and the honor system needs to come into play here. But you yeah. know, there, there's got to be some level of respect for your coworkers here. Um, I've also seen quite a few county vehicles on the road. Uh, there was something that was put in place about if there's more than two people in there or two or more, uh, they were supposed to be masked. Um, hate to tell you folks, but that ain't happening. So if we're going to do it. We need to enforce it. Yeah, I, I think reinforcing that message and uh, integrity, doing what's right, whether people are watching or not. Um, yes. And uh, okay, so your motion, have you made one yet or no? <laughs> Do we need a motion for that? I mean, no, no, do really. we all need a motion? So just to make sure we're all on the same page. Right. Um, so um, we'll go back to unvaccinated people wearing masks when at work, um, and we'll get them N95 or KN95 masks um, or the double mask. Um, we'll check on the boards and commissions to make sure. The way it was supposed to be is um, that the board members could be in the rooms, the public and others uh, were right. supposed to be virtual. So we'll make sure that's happening. What do you with the board members? They just they still have to be six feet yes. apart. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the um, uh, we, we currently also do have the room restrictions, um, and um, people in more than one more than one person in a vehicle they are supposed to be wearing um, masks. Um, we'll redouble our efforts to make sure that they do follow that. Um, appreciate knowing that one. Um, a lot of staff out there <laughs> try hard to. Get keep them all corralled sometimes. Um, the other things that we had done, um, of course we had more people teleworking. At one point we did close the building to the public, just thoughts in case. Um, we did require everyone to wear masks at one point um, when not in their private offices or going, um, with in other, you know, in hallways and things. And we did have um, daily health checks. I don't know if any was interested in any of those. No, but I measures. think people coming into the building, um, you know, again, um, I do believe in uh, privacy and honor, and you know, that they should say, "Hey, are you? I mean, are you vaccinated or not?" And uh, you know, let's start with that. And if we feel that that's not in control, then we can okay. be a little bit more, right. you know. We had direct. had some. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm interested. I'd, I'd be more interested in, and if you come in the building, you should have a mask on. What's good Everyone. for the goose? What's good for the, the goose the, is good the, for the gander. Well, we can all have masks on. I'm fine with that. But I didn't want to go that far. But I think if you're coming in the building to do business with Carroll County, you should be masked. It's my feeling. If you guys don't want to do it, I'm, I'm okay with that. But <laughs> I think it's a step we should take. This thing is getting out of control. And how long are you going to have to have the mask on? You got to walk in the door with it. You go take your bills, take care of whatever you need to do. You're probably out of here in 30 minutes or less. You can take the mask off when you get out. I just think it's a precaution to help the safety of everybody's works here and all the other county buildings that we have. I think the heart of this motion or this concept is that none of you believe that the vaccines work. Because if you truly believe the vaccines work, you wouldn't want the unvaccinated to wear masks or to go get vaccinated too. That's the lunacy of this whole thing. If I took a vaccine and I believed in it, I could care less whether you wear a mask or not. And there's a second component to this too that could lead to this county being sued. And that's discriminating those who have natural immunity, which hasn't been discussed today. If you are vaccinated and truly believe in the faith of your vaccination, you should have no worry whatsoever about the unvaccinated. That's what's so absurd about this motion, this concept. I'm not 
I absolutely disagree. Right. I mean, I we, have we, have say, we already right. know Hold through testimony. We already know through yeah. Dr. Wack and testimony of individuals a day that get fully vaccinated that they are contracting a disease. I, so me, as someone no. who's unvaccinated, have no. just as much fear of the vaccinated as the unvaccinated in spreading the disease. They might have lesser breakthrough, but it still happens. People who are vaccinated still have the potential to spread the disease. That is a fact. They also get it. So for us instituting a policy that puts masks on individuals that have some form of natural immunity, which some tests are showing potentially have more than the vaccination, we are creating a discriminatory policy. Okay, I, I absolutely disagree. I believe in the vaccines and I believe we have a responsibility to our workforce to ensure that they stay healthy, whether they want to or not. I believe in the readiness of our um, county government uh, to stay healthy because if we have uh, large outbreaks within our county government, our county will have challenging and resourcing the things we need to do. So let's move forward in making a motion that we will go with those that are uh, unvaccinated, uh, will be required to wear masks in uh, county government buildings, and those that are um, visiting into county government buildings will be masked regardless effective January 1st. I will no longer be showing up in this building and I solicit okay, the public, hold on, that's I solicit the public that's and the county employees to hey, bring a class action regardless. lawsuit. That's my motion. Do second. I have a second? I have a second. Now, I have a motion, I have a second. Is there any discussion on the motion second? Now you can say All what right. you want to say. I will solicit every employee out there to get together and level a class action lawsuit against this county for a discriminatory policy if this passes. And I also solicit all the citizens out there in the community to rise up as well. Because this motion is nothing but virtue signaling by my colleagues because it accomplishes absolutely nothing. And if anything, it proves very clearly that none of them have any faith in the vaccine which keeps failing because we're up to the third one, the fourth one coming. What's all happening after that? Everyone's in mass again, and now we've found out fact that all these mass policies, which you guys supported, were baloney. They didn't work. Unless you have an N95 or a sealed gasket, which I said from the very beginning, the masks were useless, but you guys have stuck to it. And if we look at every other jurisdiction, you, hold on, okay. if we look at every other jurisdiction out there who's put in all these mandates with vaccination masks, they have worse rates than places like Florida who've gone in the opposite direction, where they've emphasized treatment. And once again, we get a little blur about a health department, a fraction of the treatment. The treatment is what saves people's lives. We're over-focused on useless things like masks and vaccines, which are a substitute for addressing the real issue, which is public health. We need to address individual health and the treatment of the people who are most vulnerable. We didn't hear what the death rate was. That was the most critical thing. Nobody mentioned the death rate. Our ultimate goal is to save, response, save people's lives, not to play politics, and this is playing politics. Okay, I amend my motion that you're right. Masks should be appropriately uh, one, worn appropriately, and two, the masks should be appropriate masks, which are the K95s and the N95s, as opposed to just any masks. So, Which, by the, the way, is all put strain on our emergency mean, services. So we can, you're talking about the masks for our employees. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. the masks yes. for the public, right. it's, we, can't, it's, we don't have right, all those. It's whatever they have. Right, right, right. okay. So we're not cause so, a strain okay. on the resources of our people that truly need it, because so we're not taking away from them. You agree Second. With that? Okay. Now, is there any further discussion on this? Just. I, I've lost the control. Because of all the, because of all the sermon eradicate. from the pulpit. You're what, what, hey, Steve. They, uh, not, hold, hold on, Dick. I'm sorry, Steve. You're saying? I don't know what. I don't know what the motion was after that diatribe. Okay. Stuff. So, so, Steve, well, the motion once again is that government employees uh, that are unvaccinated on the honor system will wear the appropriate masks, which is the N95, K95 masks, right. um, and appropriately worn. Those that are visiting into government facilities will wear a mask uh, to do business in government facilities. Um, the effective date is 1 January. And I motioned, uh, Commissioner Frazier seconded, and as you heard, there was some dialogue from Commissioner Boucher. Now, Commissioner Weaver. I just mentioned these are just control measures. Eradication isn't going to happen, and that's what you're looking at, total control, total eradication. Uh, this is going to be around forever. All we're trying to do is control this. So we don't be in mass forever? I, we don't know what the 
the future holds. Now, I have a, enough background in pathology to know how diseases mm -hmm. work uh, and deal with, uh, you know, mutations or whatever. We don't know what's coming, and it's going to be mutations. There's going to be other things coming. We're trying to keep everybody as safe as we possibly can in the county without mandating a whole lot. We have a control over the, the our county buildings and the offices here. Just start there and see what happens. This could change next week and be totally out the window and we'll have to mm -hmm. have other measures in there. If we get that curve, I think, uh, change and start to level off, then we can lighten up on things. But I see us constantly doubling down. I mentioned, I've seen earlier how my colleagues talk about uh, we're not going to do mandates. We need to stay in our lane. That's the Board of Education. Let me let me refresh your memory that this board really jumped out of its lane and voted 4 1 to mask the children, which was totally out of our jurisdictional responsibility. We had voted before about putting masks on children. Everyone in here but me was for masking children. When did we do that? We never did that. We never did that. We never. We That's never voted for masks for children. We well, never. you guys support it and advocate it. We never. We, 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 maybe we didn't vote, but we had the discussion. We never did that. It's the Board of Education's responsibility. Exactly, but we did it here. No, no we, we did not. We it. talk about things, but we never would vote on what to do in the school system. Just like, you know, the, the concern about, you know, why folks are concerned about the schools and they're listening to this discussion because they think that we're going to mandate schools. We don't have that responsibility, nor any of us say we do. Period. There's, I mean, it's full stop. So, no, we never voted to mask kids in schools. I mean, that's, you know, we may have our own opinions, but no. What right, we're doing, again, is not mandating, mandating anything in the county, especially with businesses, our community, our schools. We advocate, as discussed, for vaccines to do what's right and get the message out that was shared by uh, everybody that's in this room that vaccines are the best thing going to minimize the, uh, the, the uh, problems we're having with this. And we can lead by example, like the state and others are doing by, ma not mandating, geez, by, um, <laughs> working yeah, direction uh, that those vaccinated in the government facilities uh, do not need to be masked. Those unvaccinated, they can come into the government facilities and do their work. They can get vaccinated, they can wear masks, they can do the, what's necessary. And they say from our health officials that the masks work. Yes. So that's the motion. If that's we're N95. No, that's not what they said. No. The CDC said that unless okay. it's N95 or our, above. We'll talk about what we had right now, our, our briefing this morning, mask work. Now, the N95 works, so if I'm wearing it, I'm not going to get most likely the, the virus. But mask, if I'm wearing a cloth mask, even a cloth mask. Oh, by the way, you wait, have to be wait, wait, shaving wait, wait. for a mask to work. If, if I were in a cloth mask, I will potentially will stop spreading what I have to other people. So even a cloth mask helps. So even if you're vaccinated and wind up with it, if you're not wearing a mask, you'll spread the disease, correct? Yeah, why wouldn't you? So why is it you're saying only unvaccinated people need to wear a mask when the potential exists for the vaccinated to spread the disease? That's why I find so ridiculous about this conversation. Okay, I'd like to call for a vote. We got the motion, we got the second, we've had discussion. Hey, quick, quick, Steve? Quick question, quick, quick question. Where, where are we with the um, the federal? Uh, I don't. I hate to call it a mandate, but the the, the OSHA, OSHA OSHA standards. situation. Yeah, the OSHA. Yeah, yeah I think it's still that? in the court so, system. Yes. It? So the Supreme Court will hear uh, motions arguments on January seventh. Right. And um, the last time they had an emergency situation like this, it took them several weeks to um, okay. to come out with their with their ruling. So I wouldn't expect, I mean, it'd be nice to have something sooner, but I wouldn't expect. Now, the, the OSHA had delayed or uh, implementation um, because the original dates were J December 5th for a policy and, and, um, and to know your employee's vaccination stand, status, and then January 4th for implementation. Those dates have been changed now to January 10th for policy and know your employee's vaccination status, 
and also then February 9th for actual implementation of the uh, testing if you're going to go down that path. Right. So, um, so we're coming upon some deadlines with regard to that and hopefully the Supreme Court okay. will okay. issue right. some log jam yeah. help there. Okay, that's it. I don't want to delay it anymore. I mean, we've heard you know, enough right. of it, but um, the only other thing I would add is I, I would like to see strongly recommend uh, in the common areas, but not mandate, but just just strongly recommend that everybody uses uh, you know some common sense in our common areas in our building too, or in all the buildings. Some of the buildings are smaller than the county office building. Just just you know, but again, well, not just just strongly recommend. Yep, and I uh, I agree. And common sense should be used. It should be used on social media. It should be used on lots of things. Sometimes common sense is not so common, but. Uh, Okay, I called for the vote. Um, I apologize for laying it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, against? Against. Okay, motion carries 4-1. Is there any further business that we have? I just want clarification on that last. Do you want us to add, strongly recommend that yes. everybody masked or, I mean, vaccinated or unvaccinated wear masks? In common areas, common areas with his groupings, okay. yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Just want to make sure. Um, is there any further discussion? I appreciate the uh, short notice, getting on board, having this. Um, I think it was important. I think uh, we covered a lot of ground, saying that there are no mandates in Carroll County. We are not following suit with other counties. Uh, rather not be called a Republican or Democrat, although I'm proud to be a Republican. Uh, and I think we are doing what's right for our community. So. We will have a press release go out on this. So. Okay. Nothing motion further. to adjourn. Second. Okay, I got a motion second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.